Yeah, so what a wonderful way to start our sunrise uh, or sunset so far here this afternoon. As you can see, we've got a whole lot of uh, white backed of vultures uh, pretty much sitting in the, one of the marula trees here on the open clearing of uh, quarantine. And apparently, there was a dead impala, pretty much died of natural causes, but they finished off that impala very quickly. Good afternoon everybody, my name is Cedric Dold and behind the camera with me this afternoon we've got Kat, so thank you <laughs> Thanks for joining us this afternoon and I'm hoping that we're going to get fantastic uh, sightings for everybody and uh, yes, what a good start having uh, some lovely uh, vultures up that side as you can see in the in this dead marula tree. So yes, I think uh, um, Impala was found here during the day and uh, a female and uh, you know as I said there was a lot of uh, temperature changes over the last uh, day or two and might have been a female that was quite weak and sometimes this uh, drop in temperatures like a sudden drop can uh, sometimes become detrimental to uh, weak individuals. But yes, this afternoon, who's going to be joining us as well on Wendy is uh, Tessa and Johan. And in Pridelands will be Berenice Pen Panda, our roaming team down at Amakala, Ralph and Morgan. And on the waterhole this afternoon will be Sam and right on top there in the Maasai Mara, David and Samuel. So yes, if you've got any fantastic comments or questions, suggestions on our stories that you want to send through to us uh, this afternoon, please go and visit us on our uh, Wild Earth uh, website, that is wildearth.tv and just go onto our questions page and then just make sure that you do register with us. If not, um, just register and it's quick and simple and easy. And once you're registered with us, you can send those comments and questions through. Or else you can just uh, scan that QR code in. It's a little white box at the bottom of the screen. Just open your camera on the cell phone, so frame it up, and then scan it up. And then it'll take you directly to our questions page. So yes, we will be waiting for all those lovely comments and questions from everybody this afternoon. But yes, as I say, I'm sitting here, uh, still on quarantine, just looking out and... Uh, it's amazing that it was pretty much, a, as I say, it was a female impala that these uh, white-backed vultures were feeding on. And uh, they devoured that entire impala in a matter of an hour or two and was done, finished. So it just shows you how quickly uh, these scavengers, the scavengers do feed on the carcasses around here. Yeah. Very important as well, so it just, it just doesn't leave that carcass to... Um, you know, rot too far and sometimes causes causes diseases and it's the same as our hyenas and your jackals as well very important to this system but yeah while we are sitting on the quarantine enjoying this view let's see what the weather is like all around today Good afternoon everybody. What a strange start to our sunset safari. I'm sitting with a tawny eagle and I'm fairly sure this is a spin-off from that sighting of Cedric's with all those vultures up in the tree. It's definitely an overcast and windy afternoon. It is absolutely freezing and I'm fairly sure the birds of prey are going to be out in force this afternoon. My name is Tess. I'm going to be your naturalist here on safari for the afternoon. Behind the camera is Johan. There's his thumb, very good looking. And of course, we have decided to do something a little different because I haven't been to the hyena den in a few days. So that is where I'm going to be starting as soon as we are done with a beautiful tawny eagle that is currently sitting up in the top of that tree. Now it certainly makes for a very dramatic skyline when you've got so many clouds and then this big shape up in the tree, much bigger than the Wahlberg's eagles which have just started coming back. The tawny eagle is definitely one of my favorite eagles. It's so differently colored. Now I know it's quite difficult to see in this light because of that cloudy background, but it's got that beautiful light coloration and then just a bit of a dark streak down the side of the wing. 
And I think it's probably looking for some scraps of food from those vultures being around. They're all trying to feed. They've finished the impala. And now they are literally just trying to digest some food, sitting high up in the tree in case some more scraps come along and waiting. Craig, good afternoon to you too. We're also looking forward to seeing what we can find. I'm hoping that we are successful this afternoon. It's fantastic weather for the predators. So that doesn't just apply to the raptors. It applies to things like hyenas and maybe wild dogs, lions, leopards as well. And even the smaller predators, we might, if we're very lucky, get a glimpse of some smaller predators somewhere along the line. And interestingly enough, we started our afternoon while we were setting up in camp and getting everything ready with a whole lot of birds which is very odd for this kind of weather the smaller birds were out there were scimitables there were some orange-breasted bushrikes even a gray-headed bushrike there were chin spot battises bearded woodpeckers there was a variety in camp which is quite shocking considering the weather you know it's only 18 degrees celsius it's cold, it's very windy, it's very gusty. So you'd think the birds would be having a bit of a tough time flying around. But I think in those little sheltered spots, we might get lucky. We might be looking for wind barriers today. And the animals will be doing the same thing. Because even though it's bad weather, life goes on. So this tawny eagle and all the smaller birds and the vultures and everybody else, they just have to carry on, they have to find food, they have to continue and adapt. Now, tawny eagles are known as being monogamous. However, I do not see another tawny eagle around. So perhaps this one was just more opportunistic. It was in the right place at the right time, saw the vultures and decided to come and investigate. <laughs> Kimberly, it would be amazing if this bird could spot the action at the hyena den from here. Where we are is Vuyatela Access, just to the kind of northwestern side of quarantine. So we're not far from Cedric at all. And that's why I said I think this is a spin off from Cedric's sighting. There's going to be a lot of birds of prey around battalers, tawny eagles, maybe Wahlberg's eagles, the different vulture species. But if it was a little bit higher up, maybe towards the center of quarantine, it would definitely be able to see towards the hyena den. Where it is now, though, it can probably see a little bit more of the drainage line. It's not quite high enough, it's in the dip on the other side of quarantine. But it would have good enough eyesight if it was high up in a tree to be able to see hyena activity. The birds of prey are really well known for following predators around, especially battalers, tawny eagles and vultures. And that's because they've got excellent eyesight and they follow a free food source. So I think they are quite brilliant and incredibly smart. But we are going to leave this tawny eagle trying to balance precariously on the tip of that log and we'll send you over to Berenice to say good afternoon. Wow, and welcome to a very windy but yet another beautiful afternoon on Pridelands Eco Training. We are currently just uh, sitting here in front of a beautiful big marula tree. Empty! It's quite bare. <laughs> and also my hat wants to blow off. But we also have a gorgeous view of the marvelous northern parts of the Dragonsberg. And apparently it is snowing on the southeastern part of the Dragonsberg. Nonetheless, this afternoon you are with Berenice Fischer, myself, and Panda Bear behind the camera. And we might have a really, really nice surprise for you. And I am not going to give it away. We are going to, from here, move to the area to hope and believe, I believe, I'm going to remain positive, to hope that we will find these specific animals and it's it's very exciting so but for now we're just taking in the the nice nippy wind
<laughs> Andrew is saying, oh well, Berenice, please don't fly away with this wind. And it really feels like I am about to fly off this. <laughs> to fly off this beautiful rocky outcrop that we're on currently. But um, yeah, let's cross our th fingers. Hold your thumbs. Cross your toes. Let's see if we can find these beautiful animals for you this afternoon. We're going to go on a bit of a tracking mission where we had them last later this morning and also try to see if we can pick up on their tracks. I'm going to give you one clue. It is canines after all. And uh, yeah, so just hold, hold your thumbs. We are extremely excited. So let's see what we can, we can manage this afternoon. It's extremely windy and the wind is ice cold because it is snowing currently on the southeastern parts of the Dragonsberg mountain range and that is why we are uh, yeah in this cold situation unlike yesterday it was 35 degrees <laughs> yeah no very nice you can't uh, keep us on uh, the edges of our seats like that <laughs> no that's fantastic hopefully i'm sure it's gonna be a good old surprise but yes i'm on Philomon's cut line. I'm still heading in a southerly direction. I am going to work a little bit on the southwestern corner of uh, Juma this uh, afternoon just to see if we are uh, lucky to pick up on those two leopards from uh, last night. Apparently they did come back northeast from Arethusa, uh, Arethusa airstrip. So that should come into this area. So we will just slowly Get that side and just take a look if we can pick up on any of the tracks or any signs of them. But it is definitely windy here as well, just as much as it's windy in Pridelands. I think uh, those cold front has definitely got to us now, but it's fine. It's not, it's not the end of the world. Beanies, jackets, gloves, so it all helps, it all works somehow. So this is like getting sick with it when you've got the temperatures going from highs, very highs to very lows, like uh, suddenly. Uh, so it's not good. That's why you always need to keep your chest nice and warm. Throat, gloves, head, always important. I'm approaching Zoe's junction with Philemon's cut line. So Zoe's is just in front of me and Gary Main of course I'll be jumping onto Gary Main and just gonna quickly scan Gary Main to see if they didn't cross that side. That's the main place I want to first see before I try anywhere else. going to be driving everywhere at snail pace today let me tell you because it is so cold <laughs> that if we increase the speed to above the single digits in kilometers per hour we struggle with this wind it is head on at the moment <laughs> so we've been driving around covering our ears trying to keep warm we've got some spare jackets with us because the later it gets today the colder it's gonna get but I'm hoping it means good luck. And I really thought that Cedric might whip out his uh, lion's mane this afternoon. I really did. It's his last drive from the stint. He's going on leave. I really thought he was going to be wearing that lion's mane. Tisk tisk, Cedric. Change 
changing our route up a little bit. We're doing Rebecca's Road towards um, the Hyena Den. I'm hoping there's going to be a little bit of shelter at the den, but based on the direction of the wind, it's going to be coming from south of the den, which means we must not have many awake hyena cubs. I think they're going to be inside that termite mound. They're going to be cuddling up together because that's exactly what we would do as well. It's cold. We might have an adult or two maybe. But I don't know how lucky we're going to get with some cub action. But that's okay. We're going to try anyway. Because it's always worth checking. They always tend to surprise us at the weirdest of times. Nadia, hot chocolate after drive sounds perfect. Thank you, that is very kind. Very, very kind. I do love a good hot chocolate on a cold day, hey Johan? Mm, too good. So Johan and I brought some coffee with us today. Not often that we get to bring full-on coffee on the afternoon drive, but we even have a spare flask, because it is cold. And in comparison to yesterday, we were chatting about it earlier, you know, guys were all in shorts, I was in my normal three-quarter pants. We were shade hopping, it was so hot. We each had about five different bottles of water and energy drink or whatever with us. No thought of coffee yesterday. Going over to today, and we're in, I'm in three layers with gloves and a beanie and I'm still cold. Got a scarf with me. Feeling they're gonna be making an appearance sooner than expected. So that cold front hit very hard, but we knew it was coming. We had that weird berg wind a few days ago. And the, uh, the weather in the Eastern Cape has been very cold and this is blowing up from the south and that's pretty much directly south of us. It's actually snowing in the Eastern Cape a week before spring, not even a week, or two, two, three days before spring and it's snowing. So that shows you how strange the weather in South Africa is at the moment. But let me know, is the weather strange where you are as well? I'd love to know. It must be fairly global that the weather patterns have changed a bit this year. I would love to know, let me know where you are and if the weather has been a bit strange for you as well. And how has it been strange? Have there been extra rains, extra winds, intense heat? With such a high water table this year, from all the rain, I think we're in for a rather hot and humid summer. Even Gert was saying today, it's the first day for the entire year that he has worn long pants and a jacket the entirety of the day. Edward, I don't think it's ever snowed in the Greater Kruger area. Normally this part of South Africa does not get snow. Uh, we just don't have the right conditions, but places like the Eastern Cape, for example, would snow every winter. Snowed here. Not that I know of. Maybe, maybe Cedric knows if there's been something way back. But I can't think of a time when it's ever snowed in the Greater Kruger. Remember, though, the confusing part of that question is that the Greater Kruger also wraps around the Drakensberg Mountains, and the Drakensberg Mountains definitely get snow. It just depends which section of it you're looking at. So maybe much further south right at the southern section that borders with Lesotho, they might get a bit of snow, but on the mountains, not actually in the Greater Kruger Park. But that's also why we're having such cold winds. The fact that it's snowing in the Eastern Cape, and that's where the wind is coming from, it's just pumping that freezing cold air straight up here. So we are in for quite a... Uh, quite a cold day or two and then it shoots back up to the 30s again and we go straight back to incredibly hot. Are you going to land birdie? No. Flying away. Flying away. 
flying away. Flying away, flying away. Bye bye birdie. Right, let me continue towards the hyena den, but I'm going to send you to Cedric to see if he has any more information on whether it's ever snowed in the Greater Kruger Park and also to see if he's decided to finally wear long pants today because Cedric always wears shorts. Snow in the Kruger? I don't think so. I don't think uh, I don't think the temperature will get so low this side, where it'll be that perfect condition for snow. Yeah, I know the last time, uh, the last time it snowed very close to this area was uh, on the other side of the Drakensberg Mountain, where Maripskop and them, just not too far from that side. I think it was in 82, 83, 1982, 1983. That's when. Uh, uh, Apparently it had snowed, you know, as I say, in, uh, well, those days it was called Transvaal, uh, but now Mapumalanga. So, yeah, 82, 83. That's what I know about Greater Kruger Park. I don't think so. I think it's, I think the temperature is just too hot here, unless, uh, let's say, maybe back in the Ice Age or something. I'm sure that millions of years ago, I'm sure this was uh, definitely covered under snow. And ice, well, ice age, yeah. So, uh, <laughs> that's all I can think of. Uh, what's, no, I don't wear long pants. Uh, I've worn long pants, I think, once a cycle, it's just a one day. Um, my other pants, I think the button broke, so I had to wear the longs, but other than that, I've still got mine. I've got my shorts on. My legs are fine. I don't know. Actually, like if I actually feel my legs now, it's warm, warm, warm. I've got like warm legs, hot legs, warm legs, <laughs> warm legs. And uh, but my main thing is hands and head and top body. If I'm uh, yeah, if I'm warm, I'm perfect. Then I'm warm. All right. So I'm coming up on Triple M uh, North now, and um, I'm coming up on Triple M North. Just taking a look if any of those uh, leopards have come across, but I haven't seen anything so far. I think they might still be just south of us. Uh, other than that, I might, might be doing Buffalo Dam then. I think I'm going to go north to the northern areas and see if maybe Tlalamba came back as well. But yep, it is a nice, uh, nice fresh day. Fresh. Wild Earth is paying tribute to our dynasty of leopards with a royal celebration. Come dress for the affair in some of our royal family merch to show your love for these great big cats. You can browse through our leopard shirts on our website and join in the royal gathering from the 1st till the 4th of September.
right, so I'm still going up Triple M uh, uh, North here. Yeah. Um, talking about the weather, well, look, uh, today's my last drive before I go and leave, so I'm hoping for some cat action this afternoon. Uh, but I am heading back again, once again, to the Western Cape. And I know the Western Cape's uh, weather is so unpredictable that side. It can become uh, very cold, rainy. That's a big thing, very rainy, cold, and windy. But they also have beautiful days as on top of that. But I don't think as beautiful days as we do get here in uh, the low felt. I mean, we saw like the last week or two, two weeks has been fantastic. The weather here has been absolutely phenomenal. Um, so yes, but good old Western Cape. I'll take a look and see what's happening down there at the coast. Always nice to hang around the coastal areas sometimes. I shall miss the bush for a bit. But that's fine. Because it's okay. Because it's okay. All right, so we're going to go to Bobab Dam. I'm going to just see if those lines do not come down further that side. I don't know. It's... Baby, are you know, you're talking about June and the Cubbies? Yes, it'll be fantastic. Well, uh, Tess is heading on that side, so hopefully she can find them around there. Well, I am going to Bobab Dam. Apparently, the, the headlines this morning, but not the, at the dam itself. Quite, not quite far, a little bit further north of the dam itself. And they said that there were some lions. So I'm going to head that side just to see if uh, nothing has come down from that side because it has been quite cool today. And I'm hoping we might have uh, decided to come south into Juma. But yeah, it's worth a try. Also, like, you get that vulture activity on quarantine, and what's nice when you get vulture activity like that on quarantine, and especially quite a few vultures, um, as soon as those vultures start dropping down, you know, to, towards a kill or to a carcass and all that, um, you'll find a lot of predators like your hyenas, uh, leopards, lions. If they see that happening quite close to them, like, you know, I can say, like, you know, at, uh, uh, at a distance where they can see those vultures dropping, they will actually head into that direction and to go and uh, investigate. So, never know. Maybe that's uh, attracted some predators towards quarantine. We shall see. Yeah, unfortunately, these leopards haven't come across again. I think that might be Northmans or Arethusa or Tortoise Pan and Shudulu. I think it carried, oh, uh, well, I'd love to see it this afternoon, absolutely will, I'll die to see is uh, Tlalamba. I would really would love to see it. So uh, that's why I'm going to do the boundary. If nothing, no luck on those lines this side, I'm going to go. I'm going to go to where her tracks crossed east this morning into Torchwood, but I'm just, never know, maybe she decided to come back again west. Give it a go. Long shot. Long shot. Looks like they've scraped the road recently, so that's what's nice. I like when they scrape the roads and you can all of a sudden, and if there's any tracks that's coming through this side, then you know it's nice and fresh. So it looks like they've scraped the roads recently, yeah. But yes, was, uh, from the 1st to the 4th of uh, September, so that's next month, uh, it is a Leopard Fest. So if you've got any video clips or any links to videos of uh, the Juma royal family, and of course that's Queen Karula and all the uh, rest that uh, follows after her. Please go and send them through to our uh, email address that is leopards at wildearth.tv leopards at wildearth.tv and uh, make sure that you've got a date stamp on it and your name. So uh, when we do show those clips uh, uh, on our sunset safaris, uh, safaris between the 1st and the 4th of September, um, at least we know who is it from. 
So yes, please send that through to us. That'll be fantastic. The royal family of the Juma. All right, so while we continue up towards uh, Buffalo Zoo Cut Line, let's head over to Pridelands with uh, Berenice and see if she's got that surprise to show you guys. Mm. Well, Cedric, we haven't found the surprise as yet, but we have found you some, some huge, other huge surprise. <laughs> We're just on our way still to the area of the other surprise but let's just see if we can view this huge beautiful kudu kudu bull let's see if i could do that <laughs> beautiful beautiful bull with beautiful massive horns it's not always that we get to see big kudu bulls like this my goodness i mean look at this guy wow what a beast look at those incredibly long curly horns hey eh? or shall i say spiral horns there's another younger bull with him this one is just so beautiful and quite mature look at that big neck and that beautiful beard oh that is just so gorgeous it's called a greater kudu greater kudu bull they are part of the tragalophus tragalophini tribe and i wonder if you folks can tell me what does Tragalafini, Tragalafus mean? What does it mean? And then which antelope is part of the Tragalafini tribe? See, they are browsing. So they're feeding on the shrubs and on trees and bushes. Even fallen trees, they're feeding on those those uh, nice leaves oh, gorgeous this is just so beautiful we never get to see these guys so calm they always just make a run for it so it's lovely to spend time with them very very nice so young bull has got quite a lot of ox pickers on his body all lined up in those nice parallel stripes on the side of the body and look how well this guy with the big horns blends in with his surroundings and with the with the bushes there in front of him and he's got nice white tips white ivory tips on top of his horns So Scott has a question and Scott is asking where does the name Kudu come from? So Kudu, I always say <laughs> when a Kudu bull walks up to a rocky outcrop or on top of a um, termite mount and he looks across and he sees a few bushes and he says to the bushes I could do eat you I could do eat you and I could do eat you and that's that's where I think the name comes from but that is a really good question I do know where the name comes from let's see if you can tell me where what does Tragalafus Tragalafini mean and which other antelope in the same tribe belongs in the same tribe and also where does the name Kudu come from? Look at 
look at those horns it's so stunning and yes 100 percent their horns are so gorgeous my goodness and i don't know how many kudu you've seen before but sometimes you get kudu bulls with horns very closely situated to one another and then other kudu bulls horns grow further apart from one another and that's quite interesting because kudu do like thicket areas so they do roam through thick areas where there's a lot of trees and shrubs that they can feed on bushes that they can feed on so the more they roam through very thick stuff and that's also why they have such huge ears is because they can hear well so that they can hear very well they also have satellite hearing and also selective hearing so the more they roam through thick bush the closer the horns would grow and then the more they roam in more open areas the further apart the horns are allowed to grow but when they're in thick areas the horns are normally closely situated to one another and it kind of makes sense right so the more open spaces the more space the horns has to grow to the sides well that was a lovely lovely sight of two kudu bulls Line. Doesn't look like anything was at uh, Bobab Dam. Oh, it's going to move a little bit further down now. Oh, <laughs> definitely you're saying uh, the guy we just passed the, the tractor now busy dragging the tires, of course, just to make sure that there's no, none of these corrugation uh, bumps on the road. So it's always nice to drag the tires behind uh, the tractors. And um, saying now, if if there is any leopard or lion or wild dog or cheetah tracks or anything like that coming onto the road now and we do see it and it's definitely very fresh, very fresh. Shortcut, I think we must do Gallego shortcut or might actually just go right through to the dam. So I just thought I saw something that side, but very far. I don't even know what I saw there. Uh, my, my eyes is playing tricks with me now. Yeah, there's a little stem book. A uh, little male. Oh, there he goes. Bye bye. That one is gone. He yeah, disappeared. He ran very quickly. <laughs> uh, leopard lover, I think. Uh, Mara... Yes, yeah, it's difficult to say. I think my, uh, maybe on Tandy and uh, I like Tandy and Shadow, the two sisters. Um, I think because I got to see quite a bit of them, so they're always uh, always one of my favourite leopards to see. And uh, uh, all of them, Shavambalan, Quarantine. Um, Oh. Numa. No, it's a lot of them, most of them. I can't really say which one. I love Tony. Tony was one of my favorites, of course. I, always would, I would always say that. But um, uh, they were all fantastic. All good in their own ways. Alright. Who's going to come past here? Yeah, I'm just worried about this dip. I know that the signal uh, just dies sometimes down here. It's hold. Oh, I don't like that. I see Bob wire. I see Bob wire lying down on the ground. I just want to cry. So I'm gonna...
Wendy, stop smelling, man. Stop smelling. Ah, 50,000 steps. Yeah. Meanwhile, it's the bumps on Wendy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Makes you feel so good. <laughs> I used to wear one as well. I actually only stopped wearing one when I had my wrist surgery. Because now it hurts me even after the surgery. If I wear my watch there, I can't get so sore. Oh, well, isn't this riveting? So we are here at a beautiful Okukuyo up in the Namibia and we've started to see some animals coming back down. They did disappear for a short period in the early afternoon just after lunchtime but I do see that slowly but surely we are getting the zebra and the springbuck back and I'm sure that the rest will follow shortly for us. For those that don't know my name is Sam and I am controlling the dam cameras for us today. quite fun watching how different things happen up here in Okukuyo as compared to some of our other dam cameras where the animals here are very very relaxed around the water where we see in Mashatu they will not go into the water for fear of their crocodile and at Juma we just don't get quite as much variety in terms of mammals so seeing this huge change in the antelope populations up in Okukuyo really is special each of these cameras have got their own sort of telltale species that are associated with them. It looks to be a very stunning afternoon up there. Nice clear skies. It doesn't appear that there's too much wind, maybe just a slight breeze. And it really does look like it would just be awesome. I would love to be sitting on the side of this dam at the moment and enjoying it. I mean, it seems to have the best view possible. Zachary, I have to agree with you. Those zebra have been giving me some headaches today. This is my first day controlling the Okukuyo dam cam. And those zebra with the white rocks do really sort of blend in quite well. That stripy pattern on them makes it very, very difficult to see. But it is quite fun. It adds a whole new dimension to this game of hide and go spot. And it's very entertaining. It's the same sort of concept I'm seeing with the lapwings. As there are quite a few lapwings nesting around this dam. And you can see there as well that those white stones really hide these lappings quite well with the coloration. 
the lap wings colors as well obviously blend in here with that black white and gray in sort of uneven spaces it makes a perfect shadowing as if they were just a boulder on lying on the ground with the sun hitting them in strange places makes for quite the optical illusion it's also quite different in terms of the bird life here you do hear that the birds are quite quiet here where we know at Mashatu they get very very loud and even at Juma we can have quite a wide variety that appear but here I have noticed we've got a little bit less variety we're seeing predominantly these lapwings around the dam there's definitely some swifts and swallows coming down and we've seen one or two storks as well in herons this afternoon. But while I sit here and enjoy my damn cameras, I'm going to head us over to Cedric to see how he's doing this afternoon. Well, I think even the birds are struggling to fly in this weather today. All this uh, wind that's around at the moment. Just trying to get some uh, bird life around here, but it just uh, it seems a little bit quiet on that side. So I think I'm maybe going to head towards Bufalzik Dam and see if there's any any old hippopotamouses in there. Let's see how they are doing. Now that we had two of them in that in the water hole this morning. some impalas. Hello impalas on the on fire break. A couple of males and a female, well actually one male and the females. Looks like he's got his little harem going here. You see he's just moving, making sure that all the females are still kept close to each other there and still in his harem and he's just to make sure that they're not gonna move away from his little herd. But the biggest, I think it's like four or five females there. Compared to some of those big uh, harems that we're getting on uh, on quarantine open. Sure, I tell you, some of those harems is like, like 50, 60 females there together. Yeah, it's not the greatest. I'm all behind. It's amazing that all these uh, all these trees are starting to start getting the new shoots, the new little leaves coming up. And uh, especially little uh, the combretum, so it's usually your your bush waters. Oh, yeah, that's a little spin over. Little russet, little red bush willow. Oh, getting the nice little leaves. Sonic to come in like kind of a little nice lime green colors coming through. Also, no, I don't think they struggle to smell at all. I think uh, you can imagine if you've got a herd of buffalo that's situated like two kilometers down that side and that wind is coming from the buffaloes towards lions. I mean, that's going to be ideal for the lions. I mean, then they know, hey, listen, there's buffaloes in that direction. Let's go. Um, yes, maybe if it's an opposite direction, maybe a bit of a different such a scenario. I think also with predators, I find, I, I feel personally, Predators also kind of struggle a little bit more with the, uh, with the wind kind of blasting around because a lot of smells are going around. The animals are very nervous, very twitchy, and uh, they tend to uh, be more alert compared to a day that's very calm. So that's, uh, and the predator smell as well can be kind of, you know, if it's got a swirling wind around, yeah, that's, that's not a good thing for the predator. But, yeah. I'm not saying that they don't, it's just you know, advantages and disadvantages to that. If you've got any comments or any questions, as you know, please uh, send them through to our Wild Earth website. It's wildearth.tv. Go out to our questions page, make sure that you do register with us. And uh, if uh, I'm not going to go onto the website, then you can just scan the QR code in. 
with your cell phone or the camera on your cell phone, scan it, frame it up, scan it in and it'll take you directly to that questions page. Please send those things through to us. Thank you so much, it'll be fantastic. We shall be waiting. I think Tess made her way to the hyena den, if I'm not mistaken. I think she's gone that side. I wonder if she's, wonder if she's got any hyenas around the den side. Any luck there? It will be nice to find June. It will be nice to if we can find old June or the two cubs. I don't know where June has disappeared to. I haven't seen June for a few days. I'm just waiting for that little moment now, it's finding a leopard on top of a termite mound, that's what I'm waiting for. I will be very happy, very, very happy. Sign up to be an explorer and watch Wild Earth totally ad-free. Yep, you heard me right. No ads at all. And not only this, but by becoming an explorer, you help us on our mission to conserve wildlife. You spread awareness about these creatures and you contribute to helping our planet. Enjoy Wild Earth as it is intended, naturally, uninterrupted, and totally advert-free. Sign up today for this and so much more from Wild Earth. It's always nice just to have a little bit of birds for the afternoon. As you can see, we've got a beautiful lilac breasted roller, the one at the bottom, the beautiful colored one. And then just up to the right of the lilac breasted roller, we've got a lovely southern yellow billed hornbill. 
but you can see all puffed up, all getting nice and cold just like us. And uh, you can see just trying to, and they puff their feathers up like that, they kind of trap that uh, warm air underneath their feathers to keep nice and warm. As well, what they're doing here yeah, is very interesting because the wind is coming from the south southeast and uh, they're sitting on the northern side of this bush, so there's less wind on this side of the quarry bush. But look at that beautiful lilac breasted right up, beautiful colors as always. And <laughs> I was realizing, hey, don't fly, don't worry, buddy, we're not gonna bother you. enjoying each other's company for the afternoon in this cold weather. Benjamin, no, I don't think they stay away longer. I mean, you must remember, we still, it's still practically in our winter. So, Benjamin, it's supposed to be still cold. Uh, migrate, our migrants will start coming very soon, or they're already starting to come back. We've already got the yellow-billed kites, we've got the Warburgs, eagles. So we're already having some of the migrants coming back. So it's not going to delay any of the migrants coming back here for our summer because um, this cold front is a normal cold front that's coming through. And of course, it's just, uh, uh, it's just the, the norm. September, October. If we're really getting so hot in August, you can imagine. I think September, October is also going to be quite hot. So, and then there's abundance of insects uh, that's already out because all the water that's uh, lying around and still around in the, in the bush. So that's definitely enough food for everybody, for the migrants to come back as well, to come and feed on. But yeah. Just taking a look at it, they're actually enjoying this little bush now. I can understand why they're still lying on that or sitting on that one side because you can see the leaves ain't even moving on the northern side of that tree. Everything else on the southern side is pretty much swaying in the wind. into the thickets, into the shrubs, maybe a little bit more cover for him or her. You can see the bushes moving. And I'll put a light like breasted rider now he's left uh, without a friend. All by itself. But just those colours is still amazing. Even if you don't have that sunlight hitting uh, those feathers, it's still, the colors are still, it just pops out at you, it's still so striking. You can understand why insects will think it's a beautiful flower that's sitting there. And that's the main reason as well for these beautiful colors, so they can at least catch uh, the insects that, uh, that get lured to, that, to those beautiful colors. So, it's always a good way to get its food. To move on, I think uh, it's. I think I just want to try and get a little bit down towards the Falls of Kurt Dam. So I think they're about past this little buddy. Sorry, old buddy. Old buddy. Yeah, don't worry, just stay there. Let's head over to Amakala as Ralph wants to say good more afternoon to everybody. Well, good afternoon, Cedric, and good afternoon to all of you. We're coming to you live as the roaming team from the Amakala Private Game Reserve in the Eastern Cape province of South Africa. And it seems Cedric's out on the move looking for all sorts of animals. Well, that's exactly what we are doing too. Now, my name is Ralph Kirsten, and on the camera, I've got Morgan with me 
and welcome aboard folks we are in the search of a male lion that likes to frequent these parts um, and so we're just zigzagging doing a bit of a search pattern he was seen this morning but he moved into these doing so when we do that we often find all sorts of other things like strange mongoose activity maybe we find an art fark uh, there could be a caracal that pokes his nose out who knows and that's just the joy of going out in the bush now don't forget that this is an interactive experience so please send through your questions and your comments using the link wildearth.tv forward slash questions or scan the QR code on the screen when it appears and get involved with the largest game drive in the world and also what you need to do when you're searching for lions is sometimes just to stop sit and be quiet and hopefully you might hear some alarm calls and on a nice cold day like we have today here in the Eastern Cape um, he might even roar at this time of day so we're looking forward to any of those particular signs that might lead us towards the lion itself. Now what you're looking at there is a sweet thorn and very very prominent in these particular parts so we're just gonna keep sitting here for a little while and see if we can hear anything from this lion otherwise we're gonna continue on that search pattern. Well, while we do sit in silence and wait and watch, I'm going to send you up to Tessa. Good luck tracking those lions, Ralph. Good luck, good luck. It is freezing cold. We saw some kudus, they decided to lie down in the thickest bush possible <laughs> to get away from the wind, so we couldn't show you their ears sticking out of the grass. So we are on Mamba Road, headed towards Cheetah Cut Line. And hopefully, there might be something along there. So this is the junction with ju <laughs> junction <laughs> junction <laughs> junction with Drakensberg. I don't know when Ms. Lalamba is going to choose to come back, but I hope it is sometime soon. <clears throat> it's starting to go green again. It's just started to go brown and now it's starting to go green again. It's just so odd. Feels like we haven't had a proper winter. As cold as it's been, everything else has been different. It feels like we have not had a proper winter at all. Beautiful big marilla trees starting to get some leaves again. I believe you all heard myself and Johan joking about watches earlier. <laughs> the bumps on the roads make our watches count steps that don't exist. <laughs> oh, zebras. Zebras, zebras, zebras. That's exciting. Oh, and a Stienbach. That is amazing. Let's quickly see if we can reposition a little bit, get nice and flat. There we go. My head might be in the frame, so I'm gonna have to duck. 
<laughs> Sorry, Johan. <laughs> So it looks like we've got potentially that same dazzle of three from the other day. Because I can see one further back in the bush. And then a little male Stienbach. Hello, boy. <laughs> Didn't last long. A little bit nervous with the wind. But the zebras at least are looking absolutely brilliant. They are looking in such good condition. I don't, you, you can't base that on the stomach alone, but the coat condition is what I'm looking at in that, the way that the mane stands up, because zebras are very gassy. They're hind gut fermenters, but they don't have that four chambered stomach we're used to. And they produce a lot of gas while they're busy digesting. So very different, but they are looking amazing with that coat condition. If they were in bad condition, they would lose color. I believe we had a question from, was it Alexis? Alexis asking about sweet thorn in Juma because Rolf was talking about it in Amakala. We should get sweet thorn here, yes. It is native to South Africa, it can be found all the way across South Africa, up into Mozambique, Angola, all sorts of places. It's got quite a wide distribution. So yes, we should get some sweet thorn here. It would be popular with giraffes, I imagine. There comes the third one, it was hiding. Further to the right, there we go. Hello. It was hiding. I think it is that same dazzle of three. Oh, and there's a giraffe, speaking of. <laughs> wow, we found the mother load. Hello, giraffe. Now, one of our directors, Mel, was joking with us earlier when we were doing our checks before drive, and she said, the sun will appear in an hour. Mel, I will have you know you are correct. The sun has just appeared. It hasn't broken through the clouds, but it's definitely sunnier than it was. So thank you. <laughs> I don't know what that giraffe is feeding on. I just see it's... I just see it's chewing. Taking its time to chew properly, very important part. I don't know if you know this, but digestion doesn't actually start in the stomach. It starts in the mouth. So chewing is probably the most important step of digestion because if you don't chew properly, you can't activate those enzymes in your saliva that can't start digesting the food properly. But for herbivores in particular, if they don't chew properly, or oh, I don't know why you're running over, Zeb. But if they don't chew properly, they can't get through the cell wall of the grass in particular, because it's very tough. And then they literally, oh, it's got no tail. They literally cannot access any of the nutrients in the plant. They can't digest further unless they chew properly. So it's nice to see the giraffe and the zebras are chewing adequately today. Yes, I know that zebra without the tail. I've seen that one before. Oh, I think I've seen, I've seen that one on, where was it? I think it was Cheetah Cutline. I saw that zebra. But yes, we've got our two hippopotamus here at uh, Biffleshook Dam. Just all relaxing and enjoying the day's sleep. I'm sure not too long from now, especially with this cold weather. I'm surprised if they don't tend to get out a little bit earlier and go for graze around the area. But these hippos do move far. I mean, I see their tracks going across Bifflezook Cutline into Bifflezook area. I'm sure there's a big dam in that area. I'm not too sure which dam, but there must be a dam that's further north of from, uh, from where we are now because they, their tracks are in and out all the time to that area. And then some days we get them here, some days we don't get them here. You see a nice uh, school of fish. Well, I don't know if the camera's going to get it. You see that there's a nice school of fish that's just in the center 
Um, same as the other day, we saw them as well. It looks like maybe like to lie up. Yes, it's very difficult, I think, if they... I don't know if they... Yeah, we might be able to get them. Not really, no. I don't think... It looks like with the naked eye, we can see, the, see them just below the surface. Uh, a school of maybe tilapias or something like that. So that is like an ideal thing when it comes to like your kingfisher. So if a little pike kingfisher to come through here now, I'm sure that kind of pike kingfisher will pick up on that school and it'll dive in there and, uh, and go for it. I saw it the other day actually swimming on the close to the bank, or close to the, 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 the edge of the water. something else looks like it's not moving well it might be actually uh, like an island at the bar I doubt it uh, I see something dark there it's weird Well, we are still on our way to our area for the possible surprise. I hope you are still crossing your fingers. And I do hear some elephants in there. I don't know, Panda, if you can maybe see some elephants in the block here to our left. We'll have a close eye. But I want to reveal the answers from our viewers from where and what does tragalathus mean? So, Sinak, the name came from a mythical ancient Greek creature. That is also correct. That is correct. And then also, Carol Kay said it means spiral horn. So, very well done, folks. Um, that's great answers. And it is true so it's the antelope with spiral horns and along with kudu bushbuck and yala and as well as eland they all are in the same tribe called tragalophus they all have spiral horns only in the eland antelope species um, male and female bull and cow carries horns but with anyala bushbuck and kudu only the males carries the spiral gorgeous horns so well done so we're just having a nice look see for those elephants and we're still on our way to our area But we do hear elephants breaking trees and we just want to have a close look see and I think I can actually see an elephant in the bush there so we might just go around hopefully to catch them on our way to our area with the special special animals and also the kudu name stems from the indigenous kui kui language of southern Africa. So Trachus denotes from a goat and Elaphus a deer and Strepsis means twisting and Keras means horn. So that is where the na name Kudu came from, from the indigenous Kui Kui language. Awesome. So let's carry on. Let's see if we can find our gentle giants. There is an elephant. Yeah, there's two Ellie's over there. It's very far in the distance. Can you spot them there, Panda? We must just go back a little bit. They are very far in the distance there. Yeah? 
little bit more back. We are here on autopilot. I have my dearest backup here with me this afternoon, Eric, and he's doing the driving whilst my ribs are healing. I still want to go dive next month, so I must look after myself so I can dive in the deep blue ocean. There we go. There's our elephants. Oh, thank goodness we could hear them. Even in this strong wind, it can be quite tricky. I must say I'm very proud of our viewers. And I'm sure it's viewers that's been watching Wild Earth for all these years. And for getting all these answers so correct, so nicely well done. You can literally see that elephant and it looks like a big grey bush. They're just busy feeding and I'm thinking it's two, two elephant bulls. Alrighty, so I think we're gonna carry on. We're not gonna off-road. It's a good 200, 250 meters away from us. So we will love and leave our gentle giants. And for now, we will head over to Tess, who is still with her sparkle or dazzle of zebra. Dazzle is doing just fine, thank you Berenice. We've got a very itchy zebra scratching its tum-tum on the branch and she looks like she's pregnant. She doesn't just look gassy, she looks pregnant. She's very rounded and I think just enjoying that scratch so much that nothing can distract her right now. I'm loving those little wrinkles she's getting in her skin as she's pressing against the branch. Even the leg is going. Look at that. She's creasing her stripes. Hey, pretty girl. Is it so good? Very typical reading zebra behavior here. Being, be being relaxed enough to scratch her stomach like that in front of us. But also having those ears back while she did it means she was very nice and relaxed. She's not too worried about things. Oh, are we going to scratch the other side? Yes. Charlotte, yes, it is possible for all animals to get bloated, but zebras... Oh my goodness, this is too good. Look at that skin moving. Zebras are probably the most well known for getting bloated, but theirs is completely gas gas bloating but every animal is capable of having a bad day stomach wise just like every person is so bloating is a normal part of that it could be too much fiber too little fiber it could be a number of things or even just eating the wrong plants when you're young something maybe a little bit more toxic than you're used to so it's definitely possible to have some severe bloating I distinctly remember an elephant sighting with a young elephant that uh, it was very close to quarantine. I think it was on Quarantine South. Very bloated elephant. Started on quarantine and moved to Quarantine South. That's it. And uh, this poor elephant had so much gas. Pretty much with every step it took, it was making the funniest noises possible. And I think I was almost incapable of speech at that point because it was just constant, constant flow of gas. It was jet propelled. <laughs> That zebra is listening to the story saying, are you saying I'm gassy? How dare you? Unfortunately, it is the truth. Oh, it just looks so good. I want to go and scratch its belly just to see if it has that same reaction. Now you can see those ears are back. That's what I was talking about. Ears back. It shows that it's content. It's happy. Very relaxed body language. Scratching all the itches. Now this is definitely the same dazzle that we saw the other day. It's a stallion with two mares. Oh, are you going to go as well? Yes. Scratching the neck. 
And this is very typical behavior for, for zebras to <clears throat> scratch themselves on the same branch between a few different zebras. They like the smell, but I think they also know once one zebra has been scratched sufficiently, then it's probably a good idea to do the same. Zebras are well known for scratching. Oh, are we going to scratch the bum? Yes. Here comes the bum scratch. Very typical zebra move. <sighs> She's also pregnant. Look at that belly. So it's hanging lower than a than a gas belly. So it's probably the most easy way to tell. Oh my word, it's just too good. And the underarm. Oh, don't get stuck. Oh, Brittany, these zebras are living their best lives right now. The total dream to find the perfect log that fits the tummy and the bum and the neck. It's got so many shapes and rough surfaces. It's perfect. Good afternoon, Peter. Go ahead. All right, copy that. Thank you so much for that information. I'm on Cheetah Cutline now. I'll go and have a look around Central. Hello, Rola. Joined the party. Welcome. Don't think it's the same one as Cedric had earlier. It's a bit far. Copy that. Thank you so much. All right, cool. So Peter's just giving me an update on some Tlalumba tracks. So we'll head up towards Central Road Cheetah Cutline once we are done enjoying the dazzle. Since the dawn of time, man has worshipped the cat. And now, in 2022, we are no better. But here at Wild Earth, you could say our cats are a little... bigger. As part of our Leopard Fest, we want to hear from you. Email us your favorite leopard sightings that you saw whilst watching Wild Earth over the last few years and include the date and a link where possible. Join us in paying tribute to our royal family.
the dazzle hopefully will continue to entertain us. They have left the log, so the scratching debacle is complete. For now, we are back to feeding and all important chewing. And enjoying some of this nice grass that's growing along the fire break where we did a burn recently. I definitely can't blame them. Now this is definitely the cleanest looking female. or well, the cleanest of the whole dazzle in fact. So she didn't have as much of a dust bath today as the others did. Have a look at how much dirtier that zebra looks. It's that dusty brown color and you can clearly see it's been rolling on its back. gestation period of zebras. Please repeat the name if you could. We're still watching these absolutely gorgeous elephants here in the Shatu. It's been more of those quiet days, but it's nice and busy at the moment. We've got this fantastic little family group down with us. And they are keeping us in company, which is really fantastic. One of my favorite ways to spend the afternoon is just watching elephants get on with their day. There's something so nice and peaceful and tranquil with them that it really just makes you appreciate it all. And of course, in the background, there's always that ever-present sound of the little bits of bird life that do surround us here at the dam. Most notably, we have lapwings as well as the red bull quellias. But it's been a while since I've seen them all today, and I think it's just back to that whole wind thing. And on these very windy days, you may not see as much bird life as, ne as on normal days, which is really just to do with how birds struggle in this wind. If you're a little bird especially, even the slightest breeze can make flying much more effort. And of course, if you're already eating all day, you don't really want to have to be trying to fit even more in just to have the energy to sustain flight. It can be a little bit of a risk for them. So you do find on these very windy days that your birds tend to stay more in the bushes and the shrubbery where they're somewhat protected from that wind. It looks like they've had their fill and now we're going to start moving off. I'm going to try to follow them a little bit, but it can be a little bit hard when an elephant sets its mind to something. They do move rather quickly. So it looks like maybe we've just sort of changed position up a little bit, just shifting around. One elephant wants it out at the middle of the cuddle puddle. And that's now moving off to the left side. But we've still got most of that family by the spring, so I'm going to take us back in there so that we can keep watching them nicely. see how those gusts of wind come down over the dam here and they cause a huge ripple effect along the dam. So although there's the normal breeze that's blowing continuously, you do see when those gusts come in and it causes that huge spray. always love watching these little elephants when they run. They look so clumsy and uncoordinated. It's just everything sort of goes. It's like watching your puppy when you come home from work in a long day. And your dog gets just so excited to see you again and it's almost like they lose control of their bodies. And I feel that young elephants almost have that sort of a look while they're running off. Get a little bit too excited and it's very, very funny to watch an elephant get zoomies. I'm sure those of you with pets know what the zoomies are and seeing young elephants with the zoomies can be very, very entertaining. They're not always too sure about how to use all of their limbs yet and it can make for quite the spectacle.
I've long found it quite fascinating the way that elephants use their trunks to explore different things. You watch this female on the side here where she's reaching out and she's definitely going for the drink but you watch how delicately she moves her tongue or her trunk rather and it is absolutely fascinating. Lisa M, I absolutely have to agree with you there. It is one of my favorite things to do. Finding an elephant herd down by any water source can give you hours of entertainment in the right conditions. So I'm glad that you're enjoying this as much as I am because this really is my happy place just watching these elephants get on with their daily lives. You can see that we're getting to that time of day that the lighting is not absolutely perfect for these damn cameras and I'm sure we're going to start getting that ghost effect quite soon which is quite entertaining in the afternoon where you see these things moving both in slow-mo and in fast forward at the same time and you kind of just get this almost spooky after image of the animals moving but it makes for some very fascinating views. So I'm going to sit here and keep enjoying the beautiful sounds of nature with these elephants. And while I do that, I'm going to send us across to Tess, who's still there with her zebras. I'm sure she must be having a great time. So I wanted to show you a bit of a closer view of this male zebra, the stallion, with his stumpy tail. Oh wow, he chose the perfect opportunity. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Ah, that was just a little bit too much. Um, I don't know what happened to his tail. He definitely wasn't born with a deformity. It's not as though the tail didn't form. There's a scarish looking section right at the tip. But in South Africa, we would call that a burbul tail. The burbul is a specific breed of dog with a, they're known for, for the short tail. That's kind of characteristic. Um, it's actually due to docking, which is a very sad process, but that's the characteristic look and that's exactly what the zebra's tail looks like. I'd imagine something like a lion or maybe a hyena may have bitten it off when it was younger. Maybe it was a serious um, incident where it was lying down and another zebra kicked it or something like that. But it's definitely a much shorter tail than we're used to. He flaunted it for us there in the worst possible ways. Compare that to the length of those tails with that nice long section on the end with those long hairs. And you can imagine it hasn't impacted his life in a huge way because he can survive without the tail, but what it has meant is that he can't have that long swishing motion of the tail and the hairs to whip things like flies away from all of the sensitive bits because he definitely has sensitive bits and they should be covered and they're not. So he probably just has a slightly harder time than usual getting rid of flies. He would have to maybe scratch his butt a little bit more regularly, for example, scratching the rear end and maybe sticking close to the other zebras when he can on a particularly hot day in summer. Now it's not much of a problem with the wind, but in summer he might stay close to the other zebras so the whipping of their tails or the flicking of their tails might help get rid of the flies for him. But you can see he's using the tail. He's still trying to swoosh it from side to side. It just looks 
really strange. And you could see he lifted it as he was um, as he was going to the bathroom, very politely for us. Definitely wasn't expecting that as I was pointing out his tail. Today is just full of surprises, isn't it? <sighs> but at least, you know, regardless of whatever the situation is, these zebras are looking excellent. Such good condition. Or oh, you can see the baby bump from that angle of the one on the right. I hope that name was Dom. Might have been Dom or Tom, I apologize. Yes, he does match ribbon now. He can join the No Tails Club. It's a very exclusive club. And Stormstart in uh, Amakala can join the club as well. Stormstart and there was a Halfstart somewhere as well. Tom, Tom, sorry Tom, it's not Dom, it's Tom. <laughs> Yes, part of Ribbon's exclusive club. But the zebras are slowly moving north on Cheetah Cut Line, so they're moving towards the area where we are going anyway to look for those tracks of Columba. And so we'll have to see. Oh, look, there's my beanie. <laughs> we'll have to see if we can find it. But look, Johan, there's a patch of blue sky. That's crazy. Mel definitely was the weather whiz today. Is she sent the good vibes the good juju look there's sun breaking through the clouds there's a little bit of blue sky very different from when we came out but let me tell you just as cold Well, the giraffe decided to leave. He walked further east into Torchwood, down the road. I just don't think he was altogether that interested in the bush willows and things growing here. He probably went to go and find something a little bit greener, maybe down into the valley. But I'd love to know what these zebras get up to in their time, if I could follow them around all day, just to see what they do. I can hear alarm calling. So I think that that's one of those questions that any naturalist has is what do the animals do when we are not watching them? It's always a fascinating one to contemplate. But up here, we've pretty much got exactly that. The animals don't know that I am watching them. So I get that beautiful luxury of getting to enjoy them without them knowing that I am here, which is absolutely fantastic. I have no complaints whatsoever because it is true. You get to see so much more when the animals are not concerned about the humans around them. It looks like we've got quite a few zebra coming down and it looks like we're going to have some giraffe join us as well. And it's always one that I quite enjoy watching is to see which tactic the giraffes are going to take when it comes to that drink. Are they going to be doing the squat? Are they going to be doing the splits? Or are they going to employ a combination of this? Unfortunately, my camera got a little bit overexcited about coming in on these zebra, but we will go out a little bit here and we'll see them nicely. And there we go, we're starting to get better, much better view of them. Really enjoy watching these zebra up here, that they, with the white rocks of Okukuyo around them, it really makes for quite a scene, it highlights that white on them so much more. But I find that if you're not watching them very closely and you just look at a distance, it almost looks like a mirage on the land, the way that the black and white stripes blend in with the white rocks and the shadows on the landscape, it makes quite fun to watch really. It looks like these giraffe are coming in. I can just see these long bandy legs. Very, very typical giraffe movements there. And let's see, what approach are they going to take to this drinking situation? It looks like that one younger zebra is a little bit nervous about these giraffe coming in. Move to the other side of mom instead 
safe space of course you know mommy's going to protect you and these giraffes seem to be quite obnoxious there's a whole dam to choose from and yet they're coming down right where these zebra are poor zebra So as it often happens, you're looking for lions and you come across buffalo. And that's exactly what has happened to us. We were looking through the thickets and out we came in, just popped out into this open plain. I don't know what road we're on. I love doing these kind of missions and searches where we just go on zigzags all through the blocks and we've popped out i don't i can't call it into the other ranges because i don't know where we are but uh, we're with the buffalo so that's all that counts and if the male lion in the area is hungry maybe he will be following them too and an old mentor of mine once told me that if you want to find predators follow the food and well this wouldn't be a bad place to wait as well and nice also just to catch up with them the mafia here on Amakala aka buffalo it's a very healthy herd this a lot of very sort of uh, bulls in their prime there's quite a few calves and lots of females so a very healthy group and the red bulled ox pickers are flitting around jumping from body to body searching and taking out the ticks normally mostly around the tail and near to the bum and that's where most of the ticks do sort of are prevalent on buffalo as well as shame as bad as it is around the testicles Naturally, there are some babies. Um, they just did move a little bit into the thicket in the middle there, so we can't see them quite clearly now. And they're very easy to pick out, especially in this kind of light. And they've got that way more sort of fawny brown color. So as soon as one of them pops out, you will be able to see them quite easily. But what a lovely scene. You don't often get to see buffalo in such a green landscape. And we were watching them as they did walk past us. They, um, they seem to go right in next to the thickets or where there's a tree fallen down or where some of the sweet thorns are, as you might see one or two of them doing now. And the best grazing grass seems to be right in amongst the thorns and the, t the thorns didn't seem to bother them at all. They've got very thick skin and sticking their noses right into those thorns and then sticking their tongue out and wrapping it around the grass before they bite it off. And it's quite a procedure, especially in amongst those thorns, but they don't seem to mind. Slowly moving as they're grazing, A very peaceful scene but you walk onto this and it could change in a second They're way more comfortable with the vehicle and us on it but as soon as you step out on foot there is a totally different reaction I always speak of that because I always think of that um, you know the thousands of hours I've spent out in these areas on foot and you you've really got to be wondering about buffalo whenever you're walking in buffalo um, laden areas it's one of those animals that's constantly on your mind and you're listening out for those red billed ox peckers and the grunts or the snorts that might give their position away and just alert you to the fact that they're there because the For somebody on foot, a human, it's it's quick, it's immediate, and it's it's very defensive. 
And you wouldn't think that now as they slowly amble through this beautiful green grassland dotted with all the thickets. There's a bokmakiri calling. Seen that this is, um, I think it's time that we maybe either pop around and get a nice better view on them or see if we can get any more evidence of the male lion that we're trying to track. And while you give us that chance, I'm going to send you up to Samuel to say good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, all of you as in the globe. Uh, my name is Samuel Ruddy, and my cameraman is Big James. I have the tallest animal which is a giraffe, the tallest mammal here. And let's see what he's doing. From a point you can see he's eating the small branches, the trees there, taking down each and every leaves there. And these are the Maasai giraffe. This is a Maasai male giraffe. A Maasai male giraffes, you can identify them by the spots. They are web-like spots or zigzag-like spots. And actually, you know, there are three types of giraffe here in Kenya. The three giraffes here in Kenya are the Maasai giraffe that are found here in Maasai Mara, the reticulated giraffe that are found in northern Kenya, and the road child. Road child are found in West Pokot, Karamajong, Bogoria, and Barinko. see a grown-up giraffe, you see it like this one, can stand to a feet of uh, 14.1 to 18 feet. That is, see, see, that is the tall of a giraffe, the gr full grown-up. And you see there is a red, because peckers they are removing them with flies and ticks that usually come to them. You see the ossicles there? There is no hairs like, that is why you say this is a Maasai giraffe and is a male giraffe. You see there how tall they are? It's eating its dinner. How do they look, those ossicles? Very tall, stunting, well cut off, shaped. No hair there. Wow, and the giraffe nod in the middle between the ossicles. That is a giraffe nod. See the mane of the giraffe, they are well trimmed that you can identify that is old. Because when they are still young, the, the men are very sharp and stunned, like they have been brushed. But this one, they are trimmed. It's going to the small branch, small leaves with blue tongue, being one of the browsers. 
hello he doesn't even want to share with us his food or maybe look at the mouth very sharp mouth going eating the down leaf of the orange croton see the giraffe usually walk with one side leg and the other side leg for the maintenance of their body balance and also you can see the tail of the giraffe there it has a very long netted elongated whip i like sometimes because our grand fathers or our fathers usually them use them when sitting sometimes they just use them to play with their kids and maybe beating them with the uh, giraffes tail there or maybe chasing away the house flies or uh, the flies around them the male giraffe become dark as they grow old the coat pattern has been camouflage say to be very camouflage in the light and shade pattern of the savanna very interesting the threat of the giraffe are the lion sometimes i've seen a giraffe being killed by the lions and also human giraffe are always very friendly so close you can even go closer to the giraffe as compared to the lions the most interesting animal to stay with look at those red because peckers oh i don't want you here on top of my head oh jonas thank you so much actually they are so much beautiful i like giraffe as you can see they are pattern like are so much beautiful they are even admirable and that is why sometimes giraffes are the one to shoot maybe even you can take a selfie when you go to a closer to a giraffe you can take a selfie with it because of their very much beautiful and giving us the front head okay majestically join me david along with our expeditioners as we take a look at the highlights of this week in the Masai Mara. We've seen four cheetah, we've seen giraffe mating, which wasn't even on my list. Yeah. <laughs> so it's been, it's been wonderful. And remember, this fireside chat is open to all viewers. Register for free on our website and come along for the ride in the Masai Mara.
So what a stunning afternoon and what a picture-perfect moment there with those three giraffes standing so nicely together. I really, really enjoy them in this landscape up here in Okakuyo. Those white rocks really, really just stand out with all the animals moving across them like this. And then we're going to have that perfect moment with the three giraffe in line facing the same direction. Always makes for those perfect photos when you have the opportunity with the camera. And I can just picture myself lining it up perfectly at the moment to see how I'd get that shot. But it does look like they're maybe going to move off a little bit. They've already come down for their drink and now it is time to go off and do the last browsing for the day. So I'm going to bring us back down to the dam in front of us and see what little birds we've got hanging around the water's edge. As there have been quite a few through the course of the day and it's always fun to do a little bit of birding here. So while I am scanning at the water's edge, I am also going to be checking on the dam itself because there is a little grebe that has made this dam his residence home. So we will be keeping an eye open for him as he is very, very cute to get a look at as well. And I'm sure you would all love to see a view of him. In case you don't know his new name, he used to be called a dab chick. So you may know him by that. Definitely absolutely gorgeous little birds. Very, very cute little guys. I did see that bird there on the edge of the shop, but he flew off before I really got a decent look at him. But we will keep watching. We're just going to have to keep watching. It can always be quite tricky to actually find these little birds. But that is why we are here. We love the challenge. It's always quite good fun. So while I continue panning and scanning around the dams here, I would like to remind all of our viewers that we have an AMA coming up. So if you don't know, an AMA stands for Ask Me Anything. So this will be happening tomorrow evening with Steve Falconbridge, and we are getting very, very excited now. So he will be doing this AMA for explorers at 20 to 7, that is 6.40 p.m. South African time. And he is very much looking forward to answering any and all questions that you may have. So if you would like to join us and be a part of this event, you can scan the QR code that is coming up on the screen now to find out how to get involved. So it does look like these birds are trying to make a liar of me. I know that we did have quite a few lapwings hanging around the sides of the dam here, but it does seem that they've moved off. So we might have to move on to look up a little bit longer. So I'm just going to sit here and enjoy watching these giraffe walk off into the distance. And while I do that, I'm going to send you to almost the opposite side of the country to me, down to Amakala in the Eastern Cape with Rolf. So it always pays off just to be a little bit patient. These buffalo have come back down towards us and they've been sort of standing off with us it seems I don't know if it's something that they've smelt or what but very interested in us now and there are some real beasts in amongst them and it's just great to watch buffalo these are massive animals nice to be so close by as well As I say, I think there's about 30 of them. I haven't been able to count all of them though. They're moving in and between the thickets. And just such beautiful horns on them too. There's that one big male there, standing proud in the sun. And there's also lots of slobber and slime that often comes out of their nose and mouth obviously assists when they feeding on the grass but it's one of those sort of real death stares when you're in the bush and you see that 
over the thicket when you're on foot it's um, quite scary but like this in the vehicle we've got nothing to worry about and it's lovely it's so close you don't get this close to buffalo on foot without being um, on your highest alert Jesse, I'm pretty sure that they are. They, I, I don't know if they're confused as to what we are. They do see vehicles quite a lot, but uh, I definitely think that they're intrigued. Very intelligent animals are buffalo. And anyone that says otherwise, I disagree wholeheartedly. Very, very clever. So they're all just feed. Some of them are feeding, some of them are alert. I wonder, they, they could even be the smell of the lion around. He is somewhere around here. So there could be that. The, world, the wind is swirling a little bit, so you never know if they just get a little brief smell of that. That's when they can obviously also go on high alert. But the heads seem to be going back down now and feeding again. would be nice if they could indicate to us with their acute sense of smell that there is a lion and where he is. Morgan spotted a baby, there we go. Well, a youngster at least. You can see he's just getting the beginnings of the horns coming through. And they're not born with horns, they do grow after birth. So you can also sort of tell their age from the size of their horns and they first come out straight it's only later that they start sort of melting down the sides and then curling up and you can see that real different color that they have real fawny brown and more fluffy than the big boys and girls Everybody just carrying on now with the grazing. And you can hear as they walk through the thorns too, scraping on them. Also always fascinates me these big thick skinned animals, rhino, buffalo, elephants, hippos, the way that they can just walk through thorns and they don't flinch, they don't seemingly even feel it. And there are some wagtails flitting in and about and around them, taking advantage of these big animals moving and the insects that they bump up. So you see how they go for the areas around the little thickets or little clumps. Righty, so what a fabulous scene. Now that especially they've come down and they're right in our presence, some of them have even laid down. Looks like we might get trapped here. It's a lovely place to be trapped. One of the best is elephants. I wouldn't uh, say that buffalo is too far off. But I think it's time to send you up to the Masai Mara and to say hello to my good friend David Gitu. Jumbo Jumbo and a very good afternoon everyone and a very warm welcome to a sunset safari from the Maasai Mara of Kenya. Wonderful rough to have seen buffaloes. Buffaloes are good to watch. For me, I like watching them uh, from a distance and especially if it's one or two. 
should you see many together i mean i mean uh, many together 5 10 20 50 buffaloes it's a good idea to watch them well we may not be having buffaloes at the moment where i am in the masimara as you've seen i got some topis which are not bad to start our sunset drive we've been out for quite some time in uh, earlier we had signs of big rains so we had powered down but now we are back and to all of you jumbo jumbo everybody my name is david and with me on camera this afternoon as usual is Bungay. a warm welcome and we'll go back fast to our topics before we tell you our plans for the day and as usual we'll do the best we can and get you as many animals from this side of the world like Rafa in Amakala with the buffaloes we got topics to start us for a sunset drive and remember we are coming to you live from the Masai Mara of Kenya and should you have any questions comments suggestions any stories to share with us please do send them through worldearth.tv slash questions but you must be registered as a member by going to the world uh, world Earth site alternatively you can go to the qr code on your screens just scan it with your phones and it will take you to the right pages topies being ruminants you can definitely see exactly what they're doing we got some guinea hens or guinea fowls coming in the frame there not sure where they came from all of a sudden they were here five ten minutes ago we got many birds here we use for alarm calls guinea hens are examples and drongos but i'll tell you for guinea hens any alarm calls they pick from them a hundred percent sure there'll be a predator in sight you can trust them so now if you look at these toppies it's very cold where we are currently after spitting a bit the last 45 minutes oops the rains just stopped the temperatures have remained very low is that synchronized scratching or it just happened Megan Jumbo and Megan at 12 years you're asking what is the Swahili word for topi normally Megan we give them a general name and we call them Swara S A W A R A and that's a very good question from you Megan at 12 and I'm saying Jumbo to you Megan hopefully one day you're going to make your way to the Masai Mara of Kenya and come enjoy this beautiful wildlife that we got here some or one of them is starting to feed now and what they may need to do is to eat as much as they can before it gets dark because after darkness most of them will choose to lay in an area that is safe from the would-be predators and chew cud till in the morning And you can tell it's cold for them because if you look on the tails, they're tucked in. And also looking on the coat on the bodies, you can see like the fur is standing up. And I think that's to trap and keep the body heat they got until maybe when uh, the weather conditions will improve. normally preferring the short grass time to relieve himself i think that's a boy unlike small antelopes like the dick dicks which will form what you call middens and they'll have a particular spot every time they relieve themselves it's like they have a permanent toilet even if the dick dick will be five kilometers away, 
and it's time to answer a call of nature, the Lord has got the same spot. I'll spend a few more minutes here with these toppies and see what happens. Rats is going down central. Still trying to follow up on these line tracks. That uh, came in, in and out. It's difficult. It sounds like for two females. Um, the thing about this is that apparently I just spoke to one of the other guides now, and he says that uh, one in Kuhuma with the seven cubs is one female with the seven cubs is on Chile Plains. The other two aren't counted for, so I wonder, I wonder if it's these two females that uh, tracks that we've got now is not for the two Kuma females that's actually just back and forth here at the moment. But <laughs> the problem is it's not just going one direction, they're going one way then another way. Yeah, it's central, so. We had those impalas alarm calling, but we never know. Those impalas, you know, I, I can never trust impalas 100% like Kudu and Niala. So, yeah, we could have heard them calling, but I don't, I don't really think it's maybe nothing. Maybe just a small scent. A lot of wind around here picked up on these females. See, they came, they came from that side. They came this way. So they came this way. This is what's their general direction. And then all of a sudden it looks like one change direction again this way. I'm running here. I'm gonna go around this one. I'm gonna go on central. I mean not central, on um, central. Oh central, sorry. <laughs> That's it. I'm gonna go on central. Central roll. Maybe if the, the general direction is coming this way and might, might pop out here somewhere, you know, the tracks. If not the light ones. Let's double check the other thing. So in our search for whatever was causing those impalas and zebras to panic a little bit, we have found a little family of kudus. We also found tracks of a female leopard, so it seems like between the lion tracks that Cedric has and the leopard tracks that we have, there have definitely been a lot of predators moving around today, and it is the perfect weather for it, so can't really blame them. Oh, there's another one coming up here, a younger one. That's a very pretty kudu. Look at that, coming to find us. So I'm not surprised the animals are a bit nervous today. There must be so many predator smells swirling around them. Hello, gorgeous. They walk like royalty. Head held high, shoulders back, chin up. They also hide as though they are the best game players in the world. Look at that. Now you can picture straight away why these kudus are here. I don't even need to say it. Look at those green leaves. Those are very fresh shoots of bush willows. Very high nutritional value because they are fresh shoots. So this is the prime food source that any herbivore would want is fresh shoots. Because they're in the growing phase, they're higher in protein much more nutritious and probably more water content as well. So as much as they eat quite elegantly, not these massive movements, they eat quite 
speedily. They take in as much as they can. And that's because of the response of the tree. They want to eat as much as they can from one tree before they have to move on to the rest. Because the tree will have a response and it'll start sending things like tannins up to the leaves. And that makes the leaves go a little bit bitter. And they have to move on. And this tree will also let the other trees know in the immediate area that it's being predated on, it's being eaten by way of pheromones. So chemicals that the plants release and then that blows downwind and the trees downwind will pick up those pheromones and they'll immediately start sending tannins and bitter tasting um, chemicals to their leaves. So the kudus are moving upwind. The wind is blowing from the kudus towards me at a little bit of an angle, so they're moving away from or into that wind, if I can put it that way, to try and get to trees that haven't got those pheromones yet. The giraffes will do the same thing. That being said, though, kudus can tolerate a lot more chemicals than other herbivores can. Hannah, I think it would be quite nice to be a kudu for a day. The largest of the antelopes here, very regal looking. Unfortunately, still a food source, but less so than the other animals. So I suppose if you're going to be a herbivore, especially an antelope, a kudu is definitely not a bad choice. Very elegant. But kudus can even eat things like tamboeti leaves, which is poisonous. You know, kudus, black rhinos and elephants can tolerate those toxins where other animals can't, so they would also be able to take a much higher tannin load from plants. Hello girl, what did you hear? So you can see she's also got really beautiful uh, mane hairs, those slightly longer hairs down the back of her neck and down her shoulders. And this is one of the first indicators again of condition. They've had such a good winter. If they don't have enough nutrients, the, the coat starts to go dull, they lose the, the stripes. They dull down a lot and that mane doesn't stand up quite as nicely. It becomes a bit weaker because the hair loses condition. So it is so good to see them looking beautiful like that. I wonder if they know that a leopard moved through here recently because based on the wind direction, I don't think they would. I think that they are still down, no, upwind a little bit. And I think it might have been Lunga that moved through, not Lalamba. But speaking of Lunga and Lalamba and all of our other beautiful leopards, just a reminder, we are going to be celebrating our leopard fest from the 1st to the 4th of September. Basically what we'll be doing is we'll be taking the time during our sunset safaris to take a little bit of a trip down memory lane, celebrating our different leopard characters and our royal families of Juma as far back as when Queen Karula, uh, yeah, Queen Karula was reigning. So that's a long time ago. So if you are a long time viewer and you have some favorite leopard moments you'd like to share with us, you can send an email to leopards at wildearth.tv. You can include what clip it is that you remember, what moment is it that you remember with our leopards that you really want to be played. If you can, please include a date or even a link that would really help us. And also your name so we can tell everybody whose clip we are playing, whose favorite memory. And of course that'll be our sunset safaris, 1st to the 4th of September. I myself have taken a little trip down memory lane with my own leopard sightings for the 1st to the 4th of September to think back as well. And I was thinking of moments like... Tandi and Mol uh, yes, Tandi and Molwati, when Tandi was calling for Maribs and Molwati came stalking up to her that one night. That was my last sighting of Tandi. Tandi and Maribs walking down Gauri Main, meeting Kachava's cub for the first time, meeting Molwati for the first time, was in an elephant sighting and he crept up the bank. So many special memories. Oof, all the kudus have stopped feeding, so they've heard something. 
further to our west. You can see they're all standing dead still. Maybe they've heard a leopard. The only thing moving is that ox picker and the occasional tail. Ah, one has gone back to feeding at least. All right, everybody seems to have relaxed again. So maybe it was a false alarm, but I think just to be sure, I am going to go and have a look if there is anything to the west of us, because the one female in particular is still standing quite alert. Unbelievable to be here with Tristan today. Tristan and Gert have made me feel very, very much at ease and at home on the vehicle. Wendy, Ribbon is a favorite for most people. I followed Ribbon the last two and a bit years. The interaction between Clamber and her cubs and the, the way they played with one another and then would switch to, to grooming them, that was just magical to watch. And um, we're having an absolute blast. I would recommend getting a ticket to Dream if you can make it happen. So I'm coming up on Mvubu Road. I just got information about uh, two uh, lionesses, I think the Tillamati breakaways. Um, apparently they came south into Juma, they're close to Galago shortcut, came south. So we just have to try and uh, locate them. I'm not too sure how long ago, I just gave us information now for, for them for about, uh, about 10 minutes ago. So I am going to head directly into that side to see if we can find these two females of the, of the Telemati breakaways, lovely lionesses. Ooh, oh, what's it? Oh, there's, a, there's a branch that's dragging up. Come on. Check that it didn't come all the way down towards uh, Bongani for sure. For sure, as I said, I can definitely do with any kind of uh, sort of cat this afternoon on my last drive. So I'm definitely just taking a look carefully and see if I can at least end up with some nice lions or a leopard. So I am holding my thumb, uh, my thumbs here, yeah, Bongani, crossing my fingers, my legs and everything on top of that. So 
Let's, uh, let's see. Let's see, let's see. But this is either, this is, this is, I don't think it is this terrible drainage line here that's just to the uh, west of us. I don't know, this drainage line can become a little bit tricky. But we can find fine. I can see we can come right here. And there's a nice, and the sun is out as well. Can you believe it? So nice to have a little bit of sun today after a very cold start to the day and a still cold continuation of this afternoon's so sunset drive. So I'm very happy to see. Me. Well, let's head over to Tess and see if she's getting any warmer for the drive. I would love to say I'm feeling a bit warmer, but I'm really not. <laughs> the sun is trying its best to peak out, but um, has not done so successfully yet. There's a little bit of golden light, but not enough to warm us up. It's a little too late in the afternoon for the sunshine to make us any warmer, I think. So we're approaching where we had the zebras earlier on Cheetah Cut Line. We've done a bit of a loop just to check if there might be any other tracks crossing in, a, in or out where the alarm calling was. Because I'm fairly sure there was something here. Cedric felt it as well and he came over and Rusty. With all the tracks you'd think we would find something. <laughs> Apparently not. <laughs> But it does show you animals, if they don't want to be seen, they won't be seen. They won't come out. So this is pretty much where the alarm calling was happening, where the fallen marilla is. The zebras were just behind us, they panicked and ran away. And the impalas are standing here and looking over into Juma. Just off the road. <laughs> We've been scanning along the section because that, that piece of land that you're looking at now, that's where they were looking. They were standing kind of all around here on the right hand side next to the marula and looking over to the left. But let us see, maybe we'll get lucky. I suppose I don't feel like I need to put on my other jacket just yet. <laughs> so that's a positive. <laughs> oh, I can see the impalas again, Johan. I think, but very far into the blocks. They've moved as well. They were clearly feeling uncomfortable. Ah, we have been one-upped by an animal we didn't even see. We just know it was here somewhere. <laughs> it makes me feel a bit better, though, that they one-upped Cedric as well. <laughs> Not just us, Johan. <laughs> Yeah, and that's definitely one of the stranger questions I've gotten in a while, thank you. Um, that actually kind of made my day. <laughs> no, giraffes don't eat bird eggs that I'm aware of. 
don't think so. They would much rather focus on the trees and the greenery and the foliage being herbivores. They do eat bones, osteophagia, also geophagia. They chew the dirt. They're looking for specific um, elements like magnesium or phosphates, anything like that, calcium. Then they might chew things like bones or the soil or rocks. But I've never heard of giraffes eating eggs. Maybe I'm completely wrong. Have you heard of it, Johan? No. I mean, we might be completely wrong. Maybe giraffes do eat, do eat bird eggs. Yeah, they're, they're still uncomfortable. They are looking so nervous. Sorry, girls. And two boys. Oh, they are looking so nervous. Definitely something was here. Good afternoon, go ahead. Still looking over to Juma. So we did Drakensberg Road and Cedric did Cheetah Cutline, so we were working parallel in case whatever it was that uh, decided to zigzag a bit. Uh, Dion was on Juma and Brett was. Brett has left. He went to Misikaya. I'm not sure if Dion is still on the property. Sure, it must be such a nerve wracking day in this wind. AFM. Yeah, there's no one there at the moment. Brett's just left there. He said it was inactive. You're welcome to go and check. Um, Taylor, yes, impalas will get nervous with big birds of prey like martial eagles, but only really in the, the lambing season. So November, December, January, when you've got newborn impalas and very tiny impalas, then they would get nervous of some birds of prey. And that's because a big martial eagle would be able to take uh, an impala lamb. But for now, <clears throat> they wouldn't really be too worried about a big bird of prey because it wouldn't really be able to take them down. That being said, I have heard of big eagles taking down rather large prey. But I think impalas have more than enough to worry about. Look at them, they look so nervous without worrying about without um, worrying about birds of prey they've got more than enough to worry about with leopards and lions and wild dogs and things but we're going to try and put these puzzle pieces together hopefully we can figure out what all these animals are so nervous about and hopefully find the predator for now though i will send you to cedric who has found some giraffes Yes, look at that beautiful, with that sun behind them and this uh, towering of uh, giraffe that's just here yeah, on Biffles of Cut Line. Absolutely stunning. Looks like all males. One, two, three. You can just see the thick horns, thick ossicones on them. And uh, yeah, it looks like it's all four males. It looks like three, two older ones, so one mid-age and one much younger male. Very nice to have. Absolutely stunning. Oh, there's uh, five. Oh, there's five males. Wow. So what they say, we call it a tower of giraffe if they're standing still and feeding in one spot, and they call it a journey of giraffe if they're all moving together. Apparently. It looks like they are on a journey in a southerly direction into Juma. And pretty much a land a mammal with your largest heart. You're looking at a heart that weighs up to about 11 kilograms. So of course a very complicated heart and a huge heart and it really has to pump that uh, blood quite high up from him. It's a big male, five and a half meters. and has to pump that blood up right up to the brain. It's a very big heart. I think they say beats around about 160 to 170 beats per minute.
Holly, that would that, that look amazing against that sunset now. What a uh, what a like uh, backdropping with that sunset that came through. But uh, all right, so it's just Let's see where they go. Go they're heading straight south. eating and they are very happy at the moment a lot of us a lot of these uh, combretums uh, the bush willows and all that's got a like, new shoots that's coming through it's a uh, nice little green there's like lime green leaves small little lime green shoots that's coming uh, out now and they're actually enjoying that of course wrapping their tongue around it and stripping all those little leaves off Quite a nice male that as well. Big, big horns, thick horns. As you know, here on top of the horns as well. That's your females. We've got like very thin horns, and of course the hair. They still here on top of their horns. You don't have any on this channel. Sinek, yeah, that's. Uh, uh, it's uh, your giraffe's heart is the uh, largest out of all land mammals. So I'm just listening up to something, yeah. Yeah, I'm at Baobab Dam at the moment with Biffles of Cutline. Are you copy? Sorry, what's your message? No, I said I'm at Biffles of uh, Cutline with Baobab Dam. Okay, copy. Um, now I join you. This is the user space. Oh, sorry, I thought you could ring about the floor coming over. Okay, no, so, no idea. No, I'm just here yeah, with Tababat uh, and with, um, with Lamiti. Sorry about that, yeah, they're just talking. Apparently there is wild dogs slowly mobile moving towards uh, Juma side, so I am going to head into that direction and go and see if we can, hopefully we can follow up there shortly. But while we just enjoy this little bit of a moment with these beautiful giraffes, these tall land mammals, absolutely stunning. All right, I think let's go and see if we can follow up on those. Uh, 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 wild dogs, let's go follow up on those wild dogs. Apparently, they're not too far coming in from Simambili area, coming straight uh, east towards uh, Juma. Uh, we, we can head into that direction, but uh, that will be all right. Still going to take a little bit of time to get there, still about uh, a while, so. Go slowly down this road here while I can just look out for anything else. Right, let's go. Okay, Boba, damn, here we come. We might lose signal here. I didn't uh, copy that at all. Uh, that question, go with that question again, please. So we have found one of my favorites in the Franklin family, the Koki Franklin. And in fact, we found it by call, which is even better. It just makes you feel really good when you can find a bird based on its call. There's a family of four here, which in itself is a little bit unusual. 
we normally find them in pairs and then with smaller chicks. There's actually one coming over in the open there just to the right. Johan can see the gold head sticking out of the grass a little bit further to the right. Got it. Stunning. Look at that golden head. Very characteristic of the Koki Franklin. It's the only one of all of the Franklins that has a completely gold head. It looks like a crested Franklin on its wings with those streaks. But the head is completely gold and this the chest and the or the breast and the, the flanks are completely barred, which is very contradictory to the normal crested Franklin. But if it walks away from you with its head down like that, you could almost think it's a crested Franklin. Oh, wow. That is amazing. They're all disappearing now, but I'm glad I got to show you at least a glimpse. Because I think it's going to be a while before we see Koki Franklins again. All I can see is little gold heads <laughs> looking for seeds and things. That's them you can hear calling. Go ahead. That's them calling. Dion and Brett were here earlier. Chitwa and Arathusa. Oh wow, look at the different markings on that one. So this is a female Koki Franklin that's just disappeared. She lacks the completely gold head. She's got the more stripy looking head. The other three that we saw had completely gold heads, which would make them males. So I don't know whether it's a pair with two young males that are their offspring or whether it's a female with three potential mates. But either way, I think they are beautiful and very good at camouflaging. They look like a little ball of elephant dung when they bend over and sit still. But definitely not every day I get to share Koki Franklins with you. And off they go. Thank you, Johan. That was brilliant. <laughs> not the easiest birds to capture on film because they are so good at camouflaging and quite small. They're only about this big. So they're a little smaller than the Swainson Spurfowl Crested Franklins, Natal Spurfowls. They're quite a bit smaller. They look almost more like a quail. Wow, that was fun. <clears throat> so we are still on Cheetah Cut Line. We have been looking for whatever made the animals a little bit nervous, but it seems like we have had no luck. So we're going to change our strategy in case whatever this was has crossed south. We're going to go and check JC Brink Pan on Chitwa, which is literally at the bottom of Cheetah Cut Line. As you cross over to Chitwa over Gari Main, that's JC Brink Pan. And then we'll go and check towards the dam, just in case. I've got hiccups. <laughs> We were starting to feel that the temperature was evening out a bit, but now that we're driving south, <laughs> it's definitely getting colder. I'm ready for a jacket. I'm ready for the fourth layer, I think. Take the gloves off every now and then to work with the radio or anything like that, and your hands feel like they're going to freeze off. Uh, no, I think okay. well, what we did uh, Oof, I hope that Cedric gets those wild dogs. Tasha, yes, the Franklins are usually monogamous, very similar to the Spurfowl family as well. They should be monogamous, but don't confuse that with 
monogamy meaning they're with the same partner their entire life. If something happens to their existing partner, they will find a new one, but they will then be monogamous with that partner. But it's all about trying to figure out which male is going to be the best suited, which were, might be why there was one female with three males. Maybe she was testing them to see which one was going to be best. Or maybe it was a previous brood that's grown up and almost ready to leave. But yes, they should be monogamous unless a partner dies if something happens to it mysteriously vanishes they make the cutest little nests it's just a scrape in the ground so very tough to see because they're normally underneath a shrub so unless you lift it you shouldn't really be able to see it and it's just on a bare ground and they kind of scratch a bit with their feet to make it soft sand and then um, they lay their eggs there and occasionally you'll find bits and pieces of grass or twigs or something that they've laid out a little bit but it's not a proper cup nest like you used to with other birds. It's definitely not up in the trees, it's just a little scrape on the ground. Very well camouflaged eggs, they're usually speckled to look like rocks match the soil. Thank you for your question. It's nice to chat to a different Johan. <laughs> a new Johan for the day, but you can't have my Johan, he's still my Johan. Um, yes, it does take energy to fluff up the feathers. It just depends how often they do it. So once the feathers are up, obviously they're up, but if birds continu continuously shake out their feathers and then go from puffed up to normal to puffed up to normal, then it would use quite a lot of energy. But the idea of fluffing up the feathers is that you puff them out like that, then air gets trapped between the feathers and the body, and that warms up from your body heat. And then that acts as a bit of an insulation layer. It's kind of like a puffer jacket for us. That's why puffer jackets are so good. Those feathers really hold the heat in. And so their feathers are the natural barrier. They don't need, well, I'm imagining a Koki Franklin now wearing a little puffer jacket, but they don't need that. There's a built in. Uh, it's a very similar concept to impalas getting goosebumps, that pilo erection where they pull the hairs up and uh, trap air against the body to warm it up. But I'm going to send you to Cedric on his search for those wild dogs. Hopefully he gets lucky. <laughs> well, they've got information now that <laughs> wild dogs crossed uh, Biffles a cut line not too, far, not too long before we got there into where Bobab Dam is. They went uh, straight onto the wall, straight into Biffles Hook. Uh, the story of my life uh, this, this afternoon and this morning. Anyway. It's fine. It's all good and well. I'm sure we will still find something awesome coming up. I always believe. Definitely we shall believe in that. Maybe I'm just going to give a little bit of a squiz around the hyena den. Say bye to the people that are not far leave. I'm uh, sorry, the boy boy, I didn't. Uh, uh, it's easier to find animals if it's cold. Uh, is it easier to find animals when it's cold? Uh, boy boy, it's, I think it, uh, you know, it, it can be easy, but you know, when it's hot, you'll find that like your lions and that will really take kind of shelter in the shades and that. When it's nice and cool, of course, you get a lot of them still moving around, nice hunting conditions and all that, so it is easier in that way, in that sense of uh, ways, but other than that, you know, your um, your dams are much quieter, so your dams are a little bit quieter compared to your hot days, so on hot days you get a lot of animals coming down to come for a drink, and uh, you know, maybe like the elephants will come and have a little bit of a swim, a pool party, 
and the good days not uh, so much you know, as much as uh, it's hot days so you know, but you never know things have always you know that's what i say i mean definitely i think the weather's got a little bit of a, a part to play here yeah, this afternoon it is quite cool i think animals are taking more kind of shelter inside the thickets much easier for them more kind of uh, more cover especially with the wind we saw like the lilac breasted rotor and uh, and uh, southern uh, yellow-billed hornbill. And they were sitting on the northern side of the tree and just protecting themselves from the southern southeasterly wind. Continue following up on those lionesses that's come south for those. So, so we're on Aubrey's at the moment, and they set uh, towards Gallego Pan, out ah, Gallego shortcut that did come south and during the day. So I am just going to try and see if I can pick up on any of their tracks I'm around here. Yeah. Imagine, like, such, see, that's the thing, like, cool days like that, your lines are still moving quite a bit. I mean, we had line tracks on top of our vehicle tracks from this morning on Central. So, yeah. So, 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 so. Is there still visual of that much lower from uh, the Fusil Katlan? Yeah, not the, yeah, there was visual, but I'm sure now, with the pampering. Got it, got it, got it, thanks, Seps. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, Dean, I think maybe it's uh, easy to find lions. They end up more in a group, in a pride, in a family. So you won't really see one individual tracks here. Yeah, you will sometimes, but a lot of times you'll find it's a pride that's moving together. It's easier to find many than just a single one. Plus, lions are much heavier compared to your uh, leopards. And uh, so, of course, they leave more of a print on the ground compared to a leopard's print where of course uh, leopards are way lighter so but you can still see the leopard's print but not as prominent as uh, a lion's print all right let's go down Gallagher's shortcut so take a look down this side yeah it's been so many tracks going down here because there's two rough tracks it's going down here that's about it We miss those wild dogs. <laughs> just, just, just. Sign up to be an explorer and stand a chance to win a three-night stay for two in the Mashatu Tented Camp in Botswana. Mashatu is the home to our beloved Escape to Nature webcam that brings you some of our best footage daily. Discover the meandering pathways to platform-mounted tents sheltered within the hush of trees and share a meal overlooking our abundant waterhole before heading out on a safari for even more incredible wildlife.
got some really good shortcut now. I think I'm gonna head slowly towards the Lyena then while it's nice and cool getting darker now. So I think before it gets too dark, I wanna see who's around there. those two female lionesses I can't I don't see I don't uh, I don't see those uh, females tracks at all um, coming over because we had that uh, tractor that pulled the tires graded the tires or pulled the tires or graded the road and um, I'm sure it squashed all the uh, it's like the only only thing now that happened there but oh well that's going down this side. Maybe on quarantine, maybe those vultures that was around on quarantine today, maybe it attracted those uh, those lionesses towards that, uh, uh, that area that I've been clearing. Uh, maybe they went to go and investigate. We shall see. We shall see. I don't see any tracks on the road. Yeah, I'm at Biggest lion, okay. Well, it depends if it's a male or if it's a female. So, if it's a male lion, I think my biggest lion I've encountered this side is a male. Like, well, my lion was, uh, I say, Mr. T from the Mapojos. I think he was one of the biggest males I've seen around this side. Uh, when it came to females, I would think. Uh, that uh, Taylor's uh, Chilala female, uh, Bibi. So she was huge. That's the Mangeni Pride's uh, grandmother. You know, if you know the Mangeni Pride there in the western sector of the Sabi Sands, um, they're the four older females, that's their grandmother. And she came from, I think she came from the Mapojo genes, if I'm not mistaken. I think so. Let's double check on that. But yeah. Her, her paws were like huge, it looked like male lion tracks, so sometimes if we're tracking and it's just her walking down the road, we think there's, it's a male lion that we're tracking and the next moment we pick up on uh, that, uh, that female, uh, female lion and then we realize, oh, well, yeah, she is, uh, she is a big, big female. Bolt, you know, it's like a tank. But yeah, I think that'll be about time. Thank you, Mr. King, uh, Mr. T. I think Kinky Tail was big. I saw it from the Uh But this S8 male, I think he's quite a pretty boy. Uh, I think this S8 male is really a stunning male. Like that Mbali male. Got a beautiful mane. I think a nice, a nice male, that. Let's get towards uh, Nahina Den. Alright, let's see what's happening. I'm quarantined quickly. See what is happening this side. I see there's a lot of impalas over this side. That's uh, always quarantine, it's always packed with impalas. It's always nice to see. I love it. Looks like all those vultures have flown off, so there's not many vultures, or there's no vultures here at all. No. Looks like they've all decided to move on. I think it's an uh, impala, the dead impala is not going to last for too long. Oh, it's a nice water beast itself. 
take a look at old Mr. Villies. Old George the Wildebeest. So of course this is a uh, good old male wildebeest, of course our territorial bull. It enjoys the quarantine opening, so he always hangs around with the impalas here. And gets a nice safety net for him. At least he's got a lot of other eyes and ears to help him look out for any danger if there's anything around here. Of course, if there's a mouse to herd of female uh, wildebeest, that, they, that does come through here. Of course, the females, they do not have a territory. They've got like a home range. So they will move through the areas, through the male's territory. And if they think that the male's got a nice territory and it's uh, worth staying uh, behind and actually... Um, of course, uh, if the females like this guy's grazing grounds, he will, of course, uh, they'll try and remain here for a little bit longer. And then uh, you'll be lucky to be able to copulate with them. Other than that, if not, those females will move uh, further on and they'll go and look for another open clearing where there'll be another dominant bull, another territorial male that will be having these open clearings. But yes, uh, Betty, I think the main thing is that uh, the bulls are always solitary and they've got their territory, so they're territorial, where the females are in the herds and they're not territorial. In, uh, in uh, home range, but home ranges, so they move through the areas of the males. All right, let's uh, move on. Let's go see if we can get to that hyena then. As I said before, it gets too dark. Still a few vultures that's around that's just passing by now. There comes another one, yeah. All white backed vultures. So every vulture that we see here so far is a white backed vulture. That's our most common vulture species that we will have around this area. And we will see quite a few of them. And if there is something dead, it'll be the majority of uh, that species. Other than that, if it's so after them and there's still a little bit of uh, remains left, of course, fragments of bone, rib cage, and all, anything like that, you'll find. Then you'll find it'll get the, uh, the hooded vulture, the one that's got a much thinner beak, you'll come after the white back vulture, you'll come right at the end. Dark main lover, sure, only eat fruit. Oh. Mouse birds, the speckled face mouse bird, the red face mouse bird, um, your barbets, so your little crested barbets, luries, you know, the luries, the taracos, or the great Poway bird. Oh, there's a lot of uh, birds that will eat just fruits. I'll go through all the birds, I'll have to open my bird book and run through all those bird birds. Loads of them. All right, well, we're going to continue to the hyena den. Let's head over to Amakala as Ralph has found himself one too. Well, speaking of hyenas and heading to the hyena den, folks, I know that it's not very clear and it's quite far off in the distance, but that is indeed a brown hyena. So some of the other guides picked this up and we obviously shot into the area quickly because it's one of the more rare sightings that we do have. 
they are locally common but still quite difficult to spot and excuse any of the wobbles or anything we're trying to balance the camera on the back seat because we're in a bit of an awkward position and it is a long shot but that is indeed a brown hyena now we just wait for him to lift his head or anything like that and then you'll get a nice clear view on him Very brown, hairy, fluffy, and smelly. Just off that game path. Trust me, that is a brown hyena. <laughs> you can see a little bit of movement there. Ronald, I don't know of uh, brown hyena being found anywhere else um, except in Africa and I'm pretty sure they're also na um, endemic to the sort of southern part, um, sub-Saharan Africa. And in the Eastern Cape here, there are a lot of them, but they're not very easily spotted. So that's why when I heard that there was one here, we raced into the area. And now we're just hoping that he lifts his head for us. And we can see him a bit better, otherwise he just looks like a termite mound. It's about time for him to get active. So often when it is later on in the afternoon like this, you get lucky, especially when it's cool and cold and it's been raining for, you know, the last evening and into this morning so maybe it was a little bit inactive and then they can be active a little bit out of the ordinary times and without him lifting his head or anything you would never know that that's a brown hyena I'm just hoping for a bit of a better sighting than his back I think is what we're seeing there So really worth waiting for. So we are still enjoying the company of these absolutely gorgeous giants. They've really been fantastic this afternoon, spending quite a bit of time, which has been fantastic considering I didn't get to see them all day. It has been a rather elephantless day for me, so I'm very, very happy having these Ellie's spending some time this afternoon. But I do still want to move us a little bit around the dam because so often it happens at this time of the evening that jackals start sneaking down in the background and it's often while I'm busy distracted with something else. So I do want to just pan us around a little bit and check what else is happening. We know where these ellies are, it will be quite easy to return to them if we need to. And little elephant grumbles there, always quite a happy sound. Of course, not the best sound if you are driving in a game reserve and you happen to hear the Ellie's grumbling. Probably means you are too close and you may be in danger. But if you be careful and you hear these from a distance, that sound of elephants really is fantastic. And when you are close to them in game reserves, you often have these moments where everything gets so quiet around you. And you watch the elephants and their behavior changes completely from what they might have been before and it's in those moments that you know these elephants are using that very very low form of communication of theirs where they can communicate over huge distances using a series of rumbles that they can actually feel through the pads on their feet as well as here so really quite interesting the way elephants are able to communicate and it is reckoned that they probably have one of the longest 
forms of communication in terms of how far they are able to communicate with one another of any land mammal. And that includes some of us humans. I mean, yes, we have phone calls and all of that, but if you had to take that away, elephants definitely have us outstripped by quite a significant distance. <laughs> We've just come to, oh, there's at least a bird on top there. It looks like a Aramark babbler that's sitting right on top of the termite pond. But the uh, only thing that we've got here at the hyena den, it looks like there's not a single soul here at the hyena den, at the Juma clan den site. There's a nice little Aramark babblers. I love them. Always in the family groups, and I make that, that real babbling noise. And it's almost like a war cry between families. And they've got a very stunning, those red eyes. Sitting on top there, just looking in, maybe lucky with an insect or two. Yeah, it's just a Misi car is not active at all. There's nothing happening at the Misi car. I'm just enjoying this little remote pebble right on top. So there's another vehicle that's just approaching here, but we'll just, we'll just let them know there's nothing. <laughs> yes, I mean, I definitely. It looks like it. It looks like he's waiting for for the, the hyenas, but definitely there is, as I said, there is nothing here. So we will be making our way out of here now, and uh, hopefully Tess will be lucky again tomorrow morning. But yeah, <laughs> maybe the maybe the the Aramark Pueblo is waiting just as patiently as we are. Tomorrow night is uh, uh, AMA, is Ask Me Anything for all the explorers for Steve. So Steve is going to be on the AMA tomorrow night and that is 20 to 7 Central African time. And that's after of course the uh, Sunset Safari. And uh, yes, if you want any other information on that AMA, there will be a QR code that you can just scan in at the bottom of the screen and you can get more information on uh, ask me anything with Steve tomorrow night. All right, we're going to move out uh, from here. As you can see, there's nothing. Nobody's home. Not a single hyena. Not even a cub here. Nothing. 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 So that is uh, very quiet. All right. Very quiet on a cold day like this. It's uh, well, you can imagine it's not going to be the busiest around here. All right. Well, let's go down to Treehouse Dam and see what's happening there. Maybe we can uh, stop there and enjoy. Well, not really a sunset. Just uh, well, maybe some noises there. Maybe we hear those leopards calling, mating. You never know. I'll go have a bit of a stop that side. Sit there for a little bit. Okay.
Right, well we're gonna go and head off towards Trials Dam and let's head over to Tess to see how's it going on it. Safari. I hope you find something cool at Treehouse Dam said. I think it's so cold that the animals have decided to just go to bed early. Maybe they didn't wake up at all today. Only some of them did. <laughs> they decided to hit the snooze button many, many, many times. My snooze alarm is five minutes. Imagine how many times I'd have to hit it to stay in bed all day. <laughs> I'd rather turn it off, I suppose. <laughs> go back to bed. So it has gotten substantially colder. I've now got my fourth layer on. So I'm sure you can tell from the heavily popped collar, it's physically incapable of being flattened. <laughs> Sitle is the voice in my ear at the moment. <laughs> She's letting me know that she also snoozes her alarm a good few times in the mornings. I'm glad I'm not alone. Thank you, Sitle. A beautiful voice in my ear. I think on an average morning I probably snooze my alarm only twice. So I get an extra maybe eight minutes. I'm not sure if I heard that question correctly. I know it was from Marco. Asking when will nests get active Snake. again? Oh, snakes. Thank you, Johan. Apologies, everybody. Having a bit of trouble with my uh, ear, it seems. Um, so snakes will start becoming active again as soon as it warms up a little bit. Oh, Michael. Michael, wow. It's, wow, I'm having a cracker of a day. I apologize, everybody. Um, clearly, my brain is still in snooze mode, even if I turned my snooze alarm off and got up for work this morning. We all have those days, I suppose. <laughs> Maybe I need one of those active watches we were talking about earlier, Johan, that vibrates on my wrist, so I have to wake my brain up. Um, <clears throat> Michael, snakes will start becoming active again as soon as it warms up enough. So... You know, on a hot day like tomorrow, we might find snakes. I mean, myself and Panda found that African python, or southern African python, um, you're probably at least a month ago already, and that's in the dead of winter, right in the middle. So they're here because it's not so cold that they have to hibernate, fully hibernate. So they are here. They're definitely going to pick up in activity in the next month or two. By the time we get to summer, they should be pretty much everywhere moving freely. They are here at the moment. We just can't see them unless it's a really hot day and you find them sunning themselves or hunting. Um, for now, it's just uh, they're hiding in termite mounds and warm places, snoozing their alarms. They also don't have wristwatches anymore. Not smart ones anyway. My favorite snake sighting, I don't know if I'm allowed to combine this with a, with a honey badger sighting, but I had a really incredible sighting at Ngala in the north in the Mapani forest of a honey badger digging up a snake and eating it, so it probably wasn't the best day for the snake. I really enjoyed the sighting, as awful as that sounds to say. It's not something I've ever seen since, and it's always something I've wanted to see is a honey badger and a snake interacting. But a snake on its own, hmm. I have seen a python, a very, very big one, a good few meters long, uh, eating a full-grown male impala. That was mind-blowing. I've never in my life seen, oh, elephant, seen anything like that again. So that was a really cool sighting. 
I did study reptiles in my honours year, so I really enjoy reptiles and uh, I've had a good few snake interactions but those are probably some of my favourites. I actually used to have a common slug eater which is a smallish snake that I rehabilitated and released um, and it was incredible, his name was Toothless because they eat slugs so they don't have big teeth like other snakes. Elephants. I don't know if any of you have any favorite um, snake moments or anything like that. I'm going to stop here because I've got a little one coming from the right as well, so I don't want to block it. But if you have any favorite snake sightings or reptile sightings, please let me know. Or any other questions or comments or anything like that. You can scan the QR code that's on the screen or go to wildearth.tv forward slash questions and uh, submit them there. You do have to be registered though. Oh, look at it using its foot. That is amazing. So it's wrapping that plant around its trunk, or wrapping the trunk around the plant, and then trying to kick it loose. And gave up rather quickly. Not intent enough on that meal to make it count. <laughs> Amazing. Okay, let me move us a little bit forward now that the calf has crossed the road. Last thing you want to do if you've heard of elephants is cut off mom from baby. So now that it's crossed safely, let me move a bit forward. Let's see if we can get it. Oh, there's a tiny baby, Johan. A teeny, weeny, weeny, weeny calf. Oh my goodness. It looks like a termite mound, like Rolf's brown hyena. Listen to those elephants feeding. This must be a massive herd. I'm so happy they're back. Johnny, it is so cool to see elephants. The wind doesn't really bother them at all. Because they're so big, they struggle to keep cool as is. And because they don't really have many predators, they don't have to worry about predators coming to sneak up on them. For a little calf of that size, I mean, look at that comparison compared to the two slightly older ones. Something like a lion would definitely try. There have been records of a big male leopard taking a baby elephant as well. But with a herd of this size, it wouldn't be a concern. Marubs might be here, maybe stalking them, but I don't think he'd actually go for them. So they're not really too nervous in the wind. In fact, I'm sure they appreciate it because then it reduces the need for them to keep flapping their ears to try and stay cool, to try and find shade, all of those things that they struggle with on the hot days. They don't have to worry too much when it's windy or when it's cool. Oh, that was such a tiny baby. That was at least, you know, two weeks old maybe. But I wouldn't say older than a month, that little one. That's adorable. I don't know where mom is though. Mom must be one of the other cows because this big one closer to us doesn't look very attached to that one. AMAs are back, and this time it's with Nature's Medicine Man, Steve Falkenbridge. Isn't he magnificent? Where are you running, boy? Steve is best known for his deep love of the bush and profound respect for animals. So we're going to harvest some bark and some leaves of this tree because then I'm going to set up a little bit of a tea station. Join Steve on the 31st of August with your questions ready to ask him anything on Wild Earth.
So we have switched over into infrared because the light is dropping so quickly with this cloud cover. But unfortunately, our elephants are moving off rather quickly. <clears throat> you can still hear them, and I'm hoping this female is going to come out into the gap. But what I am going to do is move us a fraction forwards just because there might be a gap behind this bush willow. So a little bit of a gap of a big elephant's bum, <laughs> but very far into the thicket there. So definitely not the easiest gap to work with, but what I want you to do is just listen, because you can hear the whole herd feeding around us, so why not take it in while the night jars are starting to call, just have a listen to the elephants as they're moving away. You can actually hear that cow chewing. I'm gonna move us one more time, Johan. Let's try a little, a little bit further around the front because there might be a gap here. I don't know what we might be up against, but we'll see, I suppose. Okay, there we might have a gap from here. slightly better. You will hear there's another vehicle in the sighting with us. Oh, look at her. I don't think she's the mom of that tiny calf. She's far too relaxed that that calf has moved away. I think the calf was following its mom at a distance. But let's just have a listen again. She's busy ring barking at the moment, trying to get some water from the bush willows. So let's have a listen as they're breaking those branches off. You know, elephants work a little differently to the other mammals. If the babies are females, they tend to stay with the herd for their entire life. The herds might split at some point and they might kind of frac frac what's the, fracture, that's the word, sorry, that's the word I'm looking for. They might fracture off into smaller herds depending on resources. So if there aren't enough resources, the big herd will disappear and kind of break into smaller herds and then they'll come back together at watering holes or when the resources build up again, for example, in the wet season. The males, however, should leave the herd but anywhere between 12 and 15 to 16 years old. And they don't necessarily want to leave, but the females just don't tolerate them past that point. Because once the males get to that teenage age, very similar age range to humans, when the testosterone starts building up in those young males, they start becoming a bit aggressive, a bit unpredictable and very strong. And they start pushing the boundaries. So what happens is they start playing with younger calves. They might actually hurt a small calf. And so the females ultimately just stop tolerating it altogether. And then they'll get pushed out. Then what happens is they will have left their moms in the herd. And they will ultimately end up either in a small bachelor herd as Ascaris following big males. Or they'll end up wandering around on their own until they join and split from herds as they go through their lives. With males, they don't have to stay with the herd, but when they're young males that have just left the family herd, then that's usually when you'll find them with, uh, with other males in small bachelor herds. Right, so I'm not gonna go too far into this block following elephants because it is nightfall. So it would not be the smartest decision on my part to follow elephants in the dark. But because I can still see them with the naked eye, I'm still feeling 
comfortable enough to be close to them. But as they disappear from here, I'm not going to be following them. Oh, hello, sweet girl. She really is quite beautiful. There's a few others coming over, so we'll wait for them to move past. And in the meantime, I will send you to Cedric on a bumble. Wise at least, uh, Tess has got some elephants. Very good, very good, very nice indeed. Uh, definitely why the predator's search for today was uh, very unsuccessful. Very unsuccessful. Oh well. Better luck next time. Well, definitely, I am also gonna keep my ears and my eyes upon uh, information from, of course, from Tess, from Steve, and all of them to see to see what's gonna what's happened with uh, Columbus youngsters and. Uh, I think still, still got that hope there, but on top of that, I'll uh, definitely also put my ears to the ground with that scenario. But yes, let's see what other little nocturnal critters we can find. I'm always, I've been lucky with the genets over the last uh, few weeks, so unfortunately I'm not at my a uh, spot of, uh, well, I know where that uh, one genet saw is coming out and that's there on Vuotila Access towards Sandy Patch area. Uh, I'm not around there. Uh, but you never know, maybe find another one somewhere along the line here. Yeah. Or, or even some owls. I haven't, I haven't seen an owl for a while. I've seen the full spotted owl it's during the daytime quite a bit, which I've been fortunate with. <laughs> Fred, indeed, indeed, Fred. Um, all right, I think I'm going to lose a little bit. Of, uh, I, I want to tell you the story now before, but this, this little dip here I might have a little bit of a signal issue. I don't want, I don't want to sound like a robot. Tell you the story. Let's see if I can get through this dip first. But Fred, uh, I like that one. So, Fred, uh, it was around about what was it beginning of last year? It was the beginning of last year, and uh, there was one of the lodges in the southern side of Kruger National Park, where, of course, I was helping out at that lodge at that time. And uh, what happened is, all the guides were standing at the back area having a cup of coffee and all that. All the guests were busy having um, their breakfast and you know, doing their thing at the, the deck. And uh, the next moment I just heard a huge a yell. It was like, we need a ranger, we need a ranger, we need a ranger. So we all like, and so of course myself, I'm very much alert on that. So I kind of ran towards the deck area where all the people are having the breakfast, but everybody's standing up and all looking into the guest toilet. So I get into the guest toilet and they say, it's, it's like she's inside there, she's inside there. So I get there and I hear her, she's screaming blue murder. She's like, ah, there's a snake, there's a snake. And I'm like, I'm like sorry, she said, there's a snake. So I get there and her cubicle door is closed where the toilet is. But under the door is about a gap that wide under the cubicle door. So I look there and I'm like thinking, okay, well, I want to go in there to help her. And she closes the door on me. So she closes the door on me. I'm like, I'm like, well, ma'am, I'm trying to help you. She said, no, the snake is outside. And as she said that, I looked down and there's this black mamba curled up right beneath the, the sink of the, of the bath or the bathroom uh, or the toilet area. And I saw this uh, black mamba, but you, I tell you, it was about a half a meter from me. And I jumped out of the way, out of that bathroom 
And then when I went around, she wanted to climb out of the bathroom window, the toilet window, where the drop was going to be about three, three meters, two, three meters from there, right down. And she wanted to, she was climbing head first out. And we were trying to kind of prevent her from climbing out of that uh, toilet uh, window because we knew if she had to fall, I think uh, that fall would have done her more harm than a black mamba bite. So eventually, luckily, one of the maintenance guys went in there with a rake and he went there and he grabbed hold of the snake of the black mamba and of course he like kind of swept that snake out from the toilet. And uh, yo, I, I tell you, I thought, uh, I thought, I don't know why that snake didn't strike, but if it did, it would have hit me on my calf. It looked, seemed like, because it was even curled up, almost like ready uh, by when I saw it. So, yeah, I was very fortunate on that one. I was. Uh, I'm glad I could uh, still live another day and tell the story. So, <laughs> so uh, yeah, that was just, uh, yeah, but I felt so sorry for the lady because I mean, but the funniest thing, she went back into the toilet to close the door, but there was that big gap underneath the door, <laughs> thinking that the door being closed is going to prevent the snake from coming in, but the snake could just slither under that door, which was even worse. She would actually caught her herself there, so, but luckily that didn't happen. Luckily that snake did not go into the toilet where she was because that would have been, <laughs> it would have been terrible. Oh, so anyway. Now we can laugh about it now, but oh, of course during the time it is quite hectic and I can imagine especially guests coming from overseas and uh, well, you know, not knowing about snakes and that and not knowing about that pati uh, particular snake, uh, the black mamba. Um, yeah. But anyway, we didn't tell her much about that snake. I didn't go into detail about if that snake bites you, how quickly you could die and what happens to you, you know, it was not the right time and place to do that. So I just said, ah, oh, it's a snake, don't worry, it's swept away and it's all good. You're safe. You're free. I think one of my worst fears in this world is going to use the bathroom and there's a snake in the toilet. Hey, Johan, imagine that. I, uh, I think I would have been just like Cedric's guest and uh, screamed my head off if I found a snake in the bathroom. My worst fear with snakes is probably that, to have, to have a snake <laughs> in the toilet bowl because there are a few snakes that have done that, of course. And I think my second worst fear is probably reaching for the toilet paper and touching a spider on the, on the toilet paper instead. <laughs> this is obviously a much more common problem that women would face as opposed to men, I suppose. <laughs> but living in the bush, I mean, I know this morning I had a spider in my bathroom, a, a fairly hairy looking one, <laughs> and I left it, I mean, it's little spider, it's all right, but uh, now that I'm thinking about it, I don't actually know what I'd do if I had to run to the bathroom during the night, didn't put the light on and accidentally touched a spider. Uh, nope. Nope. <laughs> Not something that I want. Oh. I did used to have a black mamba living in my ceiling at Ingala, though. It was uh, fairly friendly. Used to kind of just pop its head out every now and then or come up and down the pole. Saw it a few times. I didn't feel terrible about that though because it couldn't get into my room. It was big enough that it wouldn't have fitted through any of the gaps anyway. <laughs> so, I didn't feel too uncomfortable with that. <laughs> but I don't know what I would do if I found a snake in my bedroom. I think I would very likely just collapse on the spot if it was something like a black mamba, if it was in my room, you know. I like to think that I'm hardcore, but I don't know what my reaction would be if I walked into my room and a black mamba lifted its head at me.
Yeah, no, even like, look, I think snakes I can handle. Snakes I can, I can handle snakes. Um, but spiders, mmm. Even if it's a little spider, I, know, I don't kill them. It's just that I don't like them. I look, it's not like I don't enjoy them. It's like, okay, I don't enjoy them. <laughs> I'm digging myself a hole, yeah. Uh, but uh, spiders are all right, they're cool. But uh, I'm not gonna handle spiders. I think spiders is one of those things that's, it's, uh, I don't know, it's creepy, crawly to me. Eight legs and uh, it always looks at you funny. So yeah, uh, <laughs> spiders is a different story. And I know like my biggest fear, like many years ago, I think maybe why I've got the fear, a fear of spiders is that, uh, I think there's a couple for a reason. One of the reasons is that we used to have a dog, like a little Jack Russell, and uh, that Jack Russell used to always bark at things outside, and we were staying in a place called Guiani, and I was about 10, 9, 10 years old, and next moment we heard the, my Jack Russell going wah, 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 outside. So of course, uh, my dad, my older brother, myself, mom, of course we went outside just to see what was happening. And there's this big baboon spider, but like a huge baboon spider against the wall at night time now. So we looked at this baboon spider and my dog's like, bah, bah, bah. I think jumped off, <laughs> jumped from the wall onto my dog's face, practically wrapped its entire, like all the legs around my dog's muzzle. And my dog's like yelped, like, ee, 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 and it ran. And you see like this little, like a little P mark along the stoop, like a straight P mark, like, <laughs> it got such a fright. <laughs> and but anyway, we ran around the house. Eventually, by the time he got back to us, he got rid of the spider somewhere. And um, yeah, no, that was, <laughs> after that I thought, yeah, those big spiders like that now can jump from the wall onto my dog, what are they going to do to me? And I was like a little kid at that time, so I think that from there it started getting a little bit of a, a fear of spiders. And then uh, those red Romans, the solifuges, going to the Kruger Park as well when I was young, going to the ablution blocks and now and again got your little torch to you know like the olden days torches and all that it sends out the worst of lights and all that and trying to look and next moment you see these solar fuses running on the ground and when you're small those spiders are so much bigger of course once you're older those spiders become like smaller but uh, no nah, that's all right i like them in the distance they do you well i know they eat the mosquitoes and all that that's good Uh, Rocky, do spiders hibernate in the winter? No, Rocky, I don't think they'll hibernate. Uh, they're not uh, cold-blooded or anything like that, so they do not hibernate. If they lay the eggs and then uh, pretty much uh, next season, I'm sure, new little spiders will come through, grow up, and then they'll kind of uh, move away from, uh, how can I say, the webs. But it depends on which spiders. You've got like the Migliomorph spiders, Miglomorph spiders, I mean, that's a baboon spiders. They can get up to about 22 years old. So baboon spiders can get to quite a good age. And they'll, they'll kind of remain under the ground because they dig holes like the trapdoor spiders and the tarantulas. So they remain under the ground. And like they're things like, almost like an umbrella handle. Uh, they little kind of, how can I say, they hold their burrow under the ground. So in case of water, so they can at least rest. And at night time, they'll come out and they'll feed on the insects. But they do not uh, hibernate. I almost go into like a dormant state, a state, uh, state. All right, so I'm coming up now towards uh, back to back to quarantine. But yeah, let's head over back to Tess to see what she's got. I think she's, she's got something special. So I know it looks like you're looking at a bunch of trees, but twice in one day I have been blessed with the rhino luck. It's the same mom and calf, I think, from this morning. They look the same. I don't know where the male's gone, but they're currently hiding. <laughs> Let me try and move us a little bit further forward. They are moving because it's night time and they're trying to find somewhere to sleep, I'm sure. They are active during the daytime usually. Wow. I almost thought they'd completely disappeared, teleported, and there they go. 
very cute little rhino bums. <laughs> that is amazing. Oh, my word, you'll hunt twice in one day. <laughs> yep, that's made my day. Oh, no. Because we want to raise awareness for the rhino's plight, and uh, how do we do A chat about rhino conservation, but we have had lengthy discussions with the Sabi Sand Nature Reserve and uh, for the first time. So I thought it might be a nice change for us to actually finish off in the evening up at this Okokuyo Dam Camp. As we've only just recently got it back and it really has been so fantastic it's this very very different sort of landscape and animal based to what we're seeing at quite a few of our other locations it really is nice and this time of the evening it is just starting to slow down and cool down up there in namibia so we've got the last sort of dregs of animals coming in for that sip of water but is it not just beautiful all those bird sounds the gentle sounds of running water and look at all of these animals. This is just gorgeous. I'm loving the reflection of all of them on the water. That water does look to be quite nice and still a beautiful evening up in Namibia. I'm having to guess that it is not all that cold up in Namibia. You can see this elephant is deciding now is the best time to take a bath, apparently. You know, about the time I would be going and taking my warm shower in the evening if I was home. Oh, not too sure what happened there. The camera got a little overexcited with that zoom. But Ellie finishing the day out with us. 
with a nice old bath. So I'm going to let him enjoy that evening shower. And while I do that, I'm going to send us across to Cedric, who has found something truly special to share with us all. Something very fascinating here. Uh, we've just got a honey badger, but this honey badger has just dug a hole where this fallen over tree is, this decaying uh, tree. And uh, he's just dug a hole and he's just gone inside that hole. So we're actually just going to wait to see if he pops out again. But uh, I wonder, he's gone really deep and he's been digging, digging, digging. And he comes out sometimes and he'll go back into this hole here. And I wonder if he's not looking for any of those grubs and and uh, insects and maybe even scorpions that's really under this decaying tree. It's an old, old tree. Yeah, here he comes. Look, there is his head, there is his head. Little honey badger, hello. Come out, he's digging. It's a male, definitely it was a male. We really we noticed. Fascinating. Been so lucky with any honey badgers. But yo, he is digging. Looks like he's digging a hole to to the core of the earth here. A very sharp nail, so that's the uh, digging skills is fantastic. And they can really dig very quickly and quite deep as well. I mean, you can imagine a termite mound that is very hard and they dig holes into those termite mounds. Yes, Dave, I am so excited as well. It's like the best way to end the show, especially today. <laughs> I'm very happy. He just needs to pop his head. Come, hey, he's going to maybe come up again. Yeah. Oh, here he comes up. <laughs> There he is. Look at that. What an incredible nocturnal animal this is. And we are so fortunate to see this honey badger yard quarantine open. <laughs> but what a fantastic yeah, it's been a it's been a tough day, uh Juma for some sure Tess and myself trying to get as much as possible. But definitely this has been my highlight for the day. Definitely right at the end. <laughs> and yes, great way to also end my stint. So I'm also very happy for that. And definitely thank you to everybody for great comments, great questions that you have been sending through. I really, really do appreciate it. enjoying this moment. <laughs> that plane is flying all over the show. Well, definitely he's just saying good night to everybody and uh, I think he's just going to do his nocturnal things. But uh, definitely from uh, all of us here at our Wild Earth, we say thank you so much for uh, joining us on today's drives and hopefully you guys will be joining us again tomorrow morning on the sunrise drives with Steve and Tess. Thank you everybody. Have a wonderful evening. Good night. Kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. <laughs>